ele é o único que não tá ouvindo esse retorno. Ele chamou ele. Mas ele, ele vai ele vai chegar, ele vai chegar lá. Tá. Qualquer coisa eu deixei pra terminar. Tá ótimo. Ah, é, no início não tem nada. É, no início não tem nada. So good afternoon, everyone. We are mo moving forward to our second panel. Uh, if in the morning we had the opportunity to uh, think about of some theoretical aspects of working with courts and tribunals, we are now moving to some what more methodological uh, panel, uh, working with large databases on courts. Uh, we are having first two presentations, then we have uh, some papers, a presentation of some PhD papers that were selected by uh, the organization, and then we have the comments. I'll briefly introduce you our commentators. We have here Rafael uh, Tinaraj. Rafael is professor and postdoctoral researcher uh, at EMAP, where he pursues his goal for developing and applying topological data analysis. Um, he completed his mathematical education at the Institut de Mathematique d'Orsay uh, in the south of Paris, and he attended as well ENS Sacli, Col Normale Supérieure, uh, where he obtained the diploma of aggregation, the teaching diploma. Okay. Also, have Lucas. Uh, Lucas is coming later, but I'll introduce him as right away. Lucas uh, started his career at the Center of Research in Law and Economic Economics of the Law of the Fundação Getúlio Vargas. And uh, he participated in several researches related to law and economics and behavioral law and economics uh, with some uh, experience in project in, uh, development and digital incubator. José Luis Nunes, our third uh, commentator, is assistant professor of law and data science F at FGV, uh, Rio de Janeiro, and researcher at the Center for Technolog Technology and Society. He holds a Master of Informatics uh, from PUC Rio, and he uh, research, his current research are Interests are empirical legal studies, data science and law, and ethical artificial intelligence. And last but not least, our fourth commentator of the afternoon, uh, Henrique Anish, uh, has graduated in physics and mathematics at Whitman, from Whitman College, currently working on master's degree in mathematical modeling here at FGV. So these are our commentators. We are now uh, moving to our first presentation, international legal data in action, ideas and applications for the ICJ and the PCIJ from Sean Fulber. I'll introduce you our first presenter who is already with us online. Sean Fulber is PhD candidate in international law at the Ludwig Maximilian's University at München. He's a legal data scientist at LawTech Group and chief legal officer at Hashid International and has a uh, rather large experience in research with empirical data. So, Sean, the floor is yours. Sean, can you hear us? Thank you. Um, you should be able to see my screen now. Sorry, can you hear me? Are you, share, you want to share your screen? We are not seeing your yeah, screen. Yes, I should be sharing my screen no, now. We can't see it. It's not working. So far, we can't see. Give me a second. Whiteboard, will that work? No, that probably will not.
<laughs> See, there doesn't seem to be a screen share. Not yet. An option to share the entire screen, is there? Uh, maybe if you share the entire screen, we will be able to see, but... There doesn't seem to, be, seem to be an option, I'm afraid. You can share individual. You can see something now? No, we're just, we're seeing you only. No, that is unfortunate. You should click on the r green button, share screen, and then share your entire screen. Maybe that's gonna yeah, work. it does, but it doesn't have an option to share the entire screen. It does have individual um, windows, but not the screen itself. Which is weird. Okay. Because I've never seen that before. Our TI people are telling us that you should open your presentation first and then put it full screen, and then you share the full screen. So far as I've understood. <laughs> Let's see if that works. No, I cannot. Let's see. And now? Not yet. Because it says screen sharing, it is showing that this screen is being shared to the feed. Mode control, no. Mode accept, no request, share clipboard, no. Also, no. Optimize for video clip, no. Um, do you have the presentation? Because I sent it to you yesterday. Yeah, we you get it in a second so that you can proceed from there, yes. and then we sh we show your presentation over here. Just a second. The TI team thing is over in the presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. We've gone through those uh, tec technical things with hybrid events, so. You know, there usually should be like a like a um, screen, like sharing the entire screen option on Zoom. And usually there is, but uh, currently there is, I don't. Why well, I, I could um, come in via Firefox and try that if you want me to. I'm giving you a second. Is that a guess? Just a second, we are checking over here. Sean, we have your presentation here. I would kind of ask you to just tell us when you need us to move to the next slide so that our team here can change it for you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you for a kind introduction. Uh, your very kind patience with these technical issues okay. <laughs> and uh, your kind invitation to the panel today. Um, I will be discussing international legal data in action. Um, that is ideas and applications for the ICJ and PCIJ. And now I'd ask you to switch to the next slide or the, the uh, two slides, actually. Next slide. Yeah, um, so the, the presentation actually has uh, two main parts. So the first is, the first is I'll be talking um, about international legal data, um, what is available, and um, now there is uh, something more available than was before and also about research questions and methods. Um, my final thoughts is just a single slide that will be very brief. And of course, I have a couple of additional slides for you um, for questions and um, uh, could you switch to the next slide? Next slide, please. Um, no, uh, one slide back. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because I will actually be publishing this uh, presentation afterwards, uh, which is the reason why it has some additional slides um, but also in case they, they come in useful for questions. Um, this will include uh, the presentation, notes, and further reading. It will be available open access in about one week, let's say. And uh, I've already registered a direct link, uh, which you probably will not be able to remember. So uh, just Google my website at some point in the next week, and it will be there on the blog. Next slide, please. Yeah, about the international data. Um, so uh, as you may have surmised, uh, data science actually requires data. 
And it's, it's not so much the issue that uh, you have too few methods to work on, but usually it's data um, you're missing. So um, when you look at international law and international relations, there are actually a huge number of international relations data sets um, on, on war, on the, the behavior of states, on political science, and all sorts of things. But the availabil availability of international legal data is very limited, comparatively. And particularly, there are very few high-quality legal corpora, that is, data sets composed primarily of texts, but also with metadata. Next slide, please. Now, you've may, you may have seen some of these slides, um, some of these data sets around. And um, I've included a couple of political science data sets in, uh, on the slide, because I could actually not find enough legal data sets <laughs> to make a full slide out of it. Uh, since uh, the, the only two major, really, truly legal corpora that I, I'm aware of are the text of trade agreements uh, by Alshna et al. And also the electronic database of investment treatings, also by Alshna et al. Um, which are truly legal data sets. Now, the UN General Debate Corpus, uh, which includes um, transcripts of the UN General Debates, and the UN Security Council Debate Corpus could be considered legal data sets. Um, because they have some relation to international law, particularly international law making, but um, these are not legal documents per se. Um, so again, there are very few international legal da data sets available at all. Next slide, please. Um, that is why I published two new data sets um, covering the International Court of Justice and the Permanent Court of National Justice. These data sets are complete collections of all ICJ and PCJ majority and minority opinions from 1922 to 2022. I update this, uh, the, the ICJ data set because the BCJ obviously is inoperable um, about every half a year. So you should be seeing the, the next update um, uh, covering the first half of 2023 uh, in a couple of weeks. And um, these are public domain, so you can do with them whatever you want. I confirmed with the registrar that the judgments themselves and the appended opinions are in the public domain themselves. So I release all my copyright on these on, on the data set compilation, and you truly can use them for whatever you think uh, is reasonable. Now, what is important is the, the data sets are actually available in several formats. The original PDF and enhanced PDF um, extracted TXT files, TXT files um, with neural network OCR, and of course, uh, the, the very complex uh, CSV files for computational analysis. So even if you never perform any computational analysis at all, you can still get the entire corpus of ICJ and PCIJ opinions as PDF files for your regular doctrinal legal work. Now, um, there is extensive documentation. I will um, discuss a couple of points, not very many. And of course, um, all the data sets are entirely open source. So you can really follow the entire process from first contact with the ICJ website to the final data sets. And, data sets. and if you have the comp computational power, you could actually run them yourselves. But um, even running on 16 cores, it still takes about eight hours. So I probably don't recommend that. Um, next slide, please. Now, I, I included a couple of statistics, um, which I will not uh, go through in detail. Uh, but just for curiosity's sake, um, so you see the, the coverage is 1922 to 2022. But uh, there is a huge gap between 1940 and 1947, obviously because of the Second World War and obviously because the PCIJ was inoperable and the ICJ have not yet taken up its operations. Um, in the version, you, you, um, you see the, the date of the data set was compiled. Uh, you can see there are about 29 variables, of which about 20, I'd say, are, are reasonably useful. And what is important, the variables are actually the same for both data sets, or almost the same, because BCIJ also has the series and series number. So you can actually combine these very, very easily and just run your analyses on both data sets at the same time. Now, um, the PCIJ has about 260 documents. The ICJ is around 2,200 documents um, with English documents, uh, slightly, um, slightly uh, um, more English documents because it, it takes, uh, takes time to translate them. Now, um, tokens are um, the, approximately the number of words in, in the corpus. So the PCIJ is around 1.3 million, the ICJ is around 50 million. So it's, it's reasonable, reasonably sized when they're very large. Again, public domain. Next slide, please. 
Now what you can see here, um, you can also uh, download in the, in the code book and separately if you want to use them for your own research or um, send some very, very um, rough descriptive analyses. Um, this is uh, documents per year. And you can immediately see 1999 uh, was a very good year for the ICJ because uh, that was the, um, the year when um, all the use of force cases, uh, the, the judgment for the use of force cases were published. And as you all know, um, most of them are duplicates of each other with some minor variation in, in parties and actors. Next slide, please. And for this reason, because there are so many duplicates, uh, you have to take into account deduplication when you run any analysis. Now, what you see here is a document similarity analysis with a, with a Pearson correlation. Um, like there are other methods, but um, this is a reasonable one and the, the results don't very much change, which shows you how similar these documents are. Now, I found in, in my personal work that a threshold about 0 0.95 gives you approximately the, the duplicate documents that you would also expect from international legal experience. And as you can see here, um, first there, there's a short, short drop off until about 0 0.9, and then a plateau, and then drops off again around uh, 0 0.99. There are actually about 20, 30 documents that are completely identical, or almost completely identical. So um, you will have to decide for yourself how to deduplicate um, if the use of force cases should be deduplicated, or if you want to use them um, as such, um, the 10, 20 documents, which are reasonably the same. So you will have to zero in on somewhere between this 0 0.9 and, and 0 0.99 um, correlation similarity threshold and, and simply decide how many uh, judgments you, you want to remove. Next slide, please. So obviously, um, there's still a lot of work to do in the data set, and I included that in the limitation section of the paper. Um, for one, I'd, um, I will be doing a lot of refactoring and, and um, transporting a different framework, which is very modular and then very strictly uh, um, isolated. With, I'll show you a slide in a moment, um, so, which makes it easier for me. So you won't, no, you won't notice the difference, but it will make it a lot easier for me to add new features and, and fix bugs. Um, then there are things like, like part of speech tagging, named entity recognition, um, extracting, including citation networks, text segmentation. Um, so the, the first two problems are fairly easy, the third one is reasonably easy, and the fourth one is actually really hard. <laughs> uh, don't expect text segmentation anytime soon. Um, next slide, please. And this is what it would look like uh, once it is refactored as in, in the TARTS framework, um, where every single um, part of the data set that is individually created is one of these dots. It's like each of these is a mathematical object. And then you have a function that maps these objects to the next object. And the final object at, at the very bottom are the, the cryptographic signatures. So that's what it would look like in about a year or two or so. Next slide, please. And where do you download it? It's open access, obviously. Um, I put it on Zenodo which uh, will probably host it for the foreseeable future that is the next 20 to 30 years. So if you build your papers on that data set, you can be reasonably certain that it will also be available in the next 20, 30 years um, if you want to do any replication analyses or go back, fix any bugs or, or whatnot. Um, one thing that is very important uh, with these DOIs, so there are actually several kinds of DOIs um, at Zenodo. Uh, there's always one concept DOI which always links to the newest version. So if you click these links, you will always get the newest version, always. Whenever I upload a new version, this will always redirect. But there are also version DOIs, and if you write an academic paper, I, a paper, I strongly recommend citing the version DOI because that um, redirects people to the very specific version you used for your analysis. Next slide, please. Yeah, about research question and methods. So what do you do with these data sets? Obviously, um, there are 10 million research questions and, and 10 million methods you could climb. And I've um, selected a couple of questions and uh, a bit of reading um, for methods so you know, um, have an idea of how to start. And um, what I'd recommend is start with doctrinal analysis because you're lawyers, uh, you know how doctrinal analysis works. 
you know what to expect um, from ICJ opinions, from international law. And that's probably the, the, the best introduction to data science you could have. Because then you could ask, um, for example, you have a specific, specific legal concept, such as um, ergonomous obligations, like, like Professor Forlati discussed earlier today. Um, how does that evolve in the jurisprudence, uh, jurisprudence of the ICJ and PCIJ? And now, of course, um, you could do very complex analyses with topic models and whatnot, but you could also just search for um, the term erga omnes and uh, pick out all lines that mention erga omnes and then use these with traditional legal research. And if you want me to during the question se section, I will actually show you live how to do that. Um, then again, textual similarities, um, the, uh, the link links between legal concepts, there are like syntactical links like the surface uh, presentation or the, the deeper meaning, the, the semantics. Um, could, you, could we discover uh, new classifications for, for legal concepts or factual problems um, as opposed to these which we have in literature so far using computational means? Um, what could also be very interesting is uh, do the legal, special, specific legal concepts, concepts appear in minority opinions before they enter a majority judgment advisor opinion later. So essentially, are, is the minority actually foreshadowing legal concepts or are the minor, minority opinions completely irrelevant? Um, I'd recommend um, having a look at the, the article by Professor Arshner, um, who did a great job in, in summarizing different computational methods you could apply to international law. Next slide, please. Now, the evergreen um, citation analysis. And um, when people um, start with uh, computational law, they usually want to do citation analysis, analysis and I don't know why. Um, of course, it's, it's reasonably easy to decide what counts as a citation, though, again, uh, it can be kind of difficult if you kind of refer to a judgment but don't cite it uh, officially in any recognizable manner. But uh, the, the question I always ask myself is, what do citations even measure? Is there any usefulness to citation analysis? Like, is there any content to citation? Um, I think it's reasonable to approach the, the subject as um, um, Wolfgang Eichner did in his ICJ paper, uh, as in building a self-citation network and um, building up its, its own foundations jurisprudence, as he argued. So I think it's a, it's a reasonable approach, but otherwise um, I'm skeptical about citation analysis. But again, if you were into that sort of thing, uh, you could ask how does the ICJ use citations? How does the PCIJ use citations? Uh, has there any, cha any change in, in use of citations since 1922, which is about 100 years, so probably yes. And um, one question where I'd argue is actually useful, uh, a useful use of citation anal analysis is uh, to enhance doctrinal research in international law. So you want to discover uh, linkages between different judgments and you want to do it a bit faster than you usually do just by reading the entire thing. Next slide, please. Now, where network analysis does shine is social network analysis. And you're probably, um, or most of you might have heard of the, the Invisible College of International Lawyers, which was proposed by Oskar Schachter in 1977 and um, has been used in various computational analyses since such as, um, I, I believe, Reedy especially, um, specifically um, referenced um, the Invisible College that is also only used uh, to study arbitration, um, arbitrators, that sort of thing. Um, but what you could also do is go even deeper and, for example, um, as, as Poznan and De Figueredo, Figueredo did in 2005, Find out if the judges favor their home state, region, culture, wealth, level, political system, maybe. Uh, they, I don't think they published their source code or analysis, or at least I couldn't find them. So uh, maybe it's worth revisiting. Um, also, any other actors which might appear in judgments, uh, what role do NGOs play? And of course, um, all the currently interesting uh, diversity issues such as gender, origin, socioeconomic status, or other personal characteristics. Next slide, please. So I include a lot of um, recommended reading if you want to go that route and uh, maybe just have a look at these articles and um, you decide if, if, if you're interested in uh, approaching ICJ decisions under a social network analysis uh, paradigm. Next slide, please.
Next slide, please. And this is where it gets kind of crazy <laughs> as a spatial analysis, because um, that's what you don't often see uh, from lawyers or you don't often see an interest from lawyers in the actual geography uh, that is proposed in international law. And of course, we all know that um, only states can appear before the International Court of Justice in contentious proceedings and only uh, UN organizations and, and sub organizations in advisory um, proceedings. But of course, um, these states and these UN organizations also um, ask questions or um, compete about certain sub-state geographic areas very often. Consider Western Sahara, East Timor, um, whatnot. Now you could find out um, what, uh, which of these, these areas appear in ICJ opinions, um, whether, what the distribution is, like a general descriptive, uh, descriptive question. But there might also be links between doctrines and spatial features. I have no idea. This is a question I've asked myself, and I simply don't know. Um, a more classical question is to ask which states uh, care about which issues in which areas, because it's almost always um, about some spatial feature. Um, and of course, there are a lot of border disputes. Um, you might have different uh, interests in a geographical interest between majority and minority opinions. And you might also ask a very abstract question uh, about commonalities, differences in the judicial treatment of land, sea, airspace, and cyberspace, um, which I probably don't recommend as an introductory uh, research question. That's it's where it gets really abstract. And how would you do that? You simply extract those geographic terms, such as uh, Western Sahara or whatnot, from the text opinions, map them to um, points or polygons, taken from a geographic database, add them to protection. For example, visualize them on a world map or perform any, any kind of statistical analysis you find interesting, such as um, spatial regression or whatnot. Next slide, please. One more. Yeah. And I do have some final thoughts if you do approach um, international law from a computational perspective. Please publish your source code and research data. I see so many articles with fantastic, number, uh, with fantastic numbers, and I have no idea if these numbers are real. I have no idea if I could trust these numbers. And um, what is also really valuable about uh, computational research is the actual computations and the, and the actual um, source code, which is used to generate those, those figures and um, numbers. So please publish your source code and research data. Uh, you can do so on the node and it's free. If you find an error or need a feature um, for either of the data sets, uh, submit me a GitHub issue and, or send me an email. I will consider it. I won't promise it, but I will consider it. And definitely, if there's an error, I will fix it. Um, but features, again, um, as time allows. And if you do publish anything based on the CICJ or CDPCIJ, I do send me a link, and I'll include it as an example in the code book um, for future researches. That's it for me. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe questions will be addressed later. Is that correct? Sean, thank you for your presentation. We couldn't have had a better presentation to begin our workshop. The idea behind this workshop is sharing experience on how to do empirical legal research. It's something new for most of us. I'm speaking as a legal scholar. We have a lot to learn. It's like learning a new language and learning a new universe. And data science is everywhere. And I think we should think about data science also in law. It's not mainstream yet in Brazil, but we are moving, moving forward, moving ahead. Uh, I'll briefly pass to our commentators. We have a team here, a mixed team from empirical legal research and also mathematics uh, to comment briefly on your paper. Thank you once again, Sean. Thank you for having me. Uh, hello, Sean. Uh, thank you for your presentation again. And I find it actually incredible the amount of data and the amount of uh, specific uh, information you guys pulled and made available for everyone regarding this data set. Uh, I believe it's absolutely rare to find so much information regarding a, a judicial body uh, available. So the only one uh, similar that I can remember made open source is the Supreme Court database regarding SCOTUS. And it's an initiative from the University of Washington. So uh, uh, really nice. And hopefully this can instigate a lot of research 
worldwide regarding international course. Uh, and I'm, I found it fascinating how you touch upon a few things that we had just talked about during lunch and earlier, uh, such as how do you measure influence and what's the purpose of a lot of stuff. Uh, and just a, a few things like I've written uh, a bit using citation data and it's usually, uh, as I had just commented with Enrique, who is here on the table too, uh, it's usually our best proxy for influence. So it goes back to the 90s, uh, a paper by Lassig, and I forgot the, the co-authors, uh, regarding influence in the US ju judicial system. And it's, I think it's usually just the best thing we have to uh, measure influence from a case on another. And I mean, without uh, tools for NLP that we have available today, I guess it was the best we had until a few years ago with development of comput uh, computational resources. And I've had some interesting, at least interesting uh, results using two cluster decisions too. So cluster decisions from the citation standpoints actually had some interesting and it worked kind of well uh, to uh, dive in identificate decisions based on subject, but it had a lot of data. I was using uh, Brazilian uh, Superior Court of Justice, which just, uh, decides on about uh, uh, on the order of hundreds of thousand cases. So it, it, it's much more data than you have available. So I'm not sure if it worked well, but I think it's worth to try at least to see how well it works. Uh, and other fascinating data that I wish I was able to have to study Brazilian courts as majority and uh, minority opinions. Like, usually end up just having to interpret, interpret the decision as a whole, because as you said, it's really hard to segmentate this. Uh, if you just have a single PDF document and you translate it to text and you have to divide that, that's a nightmare. And that's, that's really useful. And uh, the only question I actually have uh, and I had during your presentation is how you measure the similarity between decisions. Uh, I see some disappointment here on the table. I think someone else had wanted to ask this. Please go ahead. I was about to comment. Uh, Jose already commented on. So uh, yeah, I'm kind of mad at him, but this was also my only question. How did you measure that similarity or those uh, coefficients for correlation? Did you use some kind of embedding or, yeah. And I, I, I just, yeah. uh, hello, I'm Lucas. I just thought of a small thing to say is this comment of Jose, the nightmare that it is to process PDFs. And my question is, why haven't we solved that yet? Why do we have to deal with this difficulty every time we, we want to use public documents? And I don't know if there is some, some way for, for researchers to come together and provide some sort of unified approach to dealing with public documents, especially when and there, is, there isn't even a, a layer of text in the PDF. It, it becomes very difficult and how to, to divide text. I, I, I know there is work being done in this, these areas, but it seems to me that it's still not developed enough into a solution that is easy and approachable for, for researchers to use. And the floor um, is yours. Sorry? The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so about uh, similarity, it is actually really simple. So what I did is uh, simply create a bag of words of the, of the uh, different decisions. And of course, um, you know, or those who don't know what a bag of words is, a bag of words is basically you, you take all the words that are in the de a decision and you simply count how many of each word are in there. So for example, if, if the word V uh, appears 50 times, uh, you have a variable that's called the V uh, and it's you, you count it 50 times. And then um, the word FGV uh, maybe uh, appears 20 times and you count that 20 times. And you just go on. And uh, that's basically what I did. And when you do it for, for each decision, you simply end up with a matrix. It's, it's called a, um, a document feature matrix in the, in the Quantita ecosystem or document term matrix in, in most other ecosystems. And um, then because each of these, these um, documents then is a vector, that is a, an ordered um, ordered set of um, of numbers. You can simply uh, calculate the, the Pearson correlation for each decision with each other decision, and then simply decide how many to drop based on on a certain uh, threshold, and then simply create that. 
Um, I've described it in more detail in the paper itself, if you want to have a look. But also, the source code is available. So please have a look at the source code. I'm actually reasonably proud of it. So um, just go inside and, and have a look at the, the similarity analysis and, and let me know if you agree with that. Um, I have a few more uh, comments on your comments, so to say. Uh, as a measure of influence, um, it, it probably does make it did make sense in the 90s. And I, I do see that point, and I, I probably would agree that some measure of influence. I just wonder, uh, um, because it has a, sort of a, a, um, a stated preference. So you have someone who says, um, I use that judgment to come to my opinion, but they may not have. And they may simply be using it uh, to cover their actual motivation. And I'm reasonably certain that most judges um, are actually covering their real motivation in simply using citations from elsewhere to simply justify what they um, came, uh, the, the result they came to um, with a different method. But again, um, I'm, I'm willing to be persuaded otherwise. Uh, about pr processing PDFs, I'm actually um, not that worried about that. So I, I, I get that a lot, that people want structured data. But um, what you would only need structured data for is if you wanted to actually um, analyze a judgment. Well, with the ICD, it does make sense, because, of course, you'd want like, to, to separate the, the actual reasoning from the result and then from the arguments of parties. But in, in very many cases, uh, you can actually do a lot of very interesting things simply based on the entire document, such as categorizing judgments based on topics, um, extracting citations, which um, doesn't really matter that much unless you uh, mistakenly extract the citations from the parties. I believe those are um, those of the court. But again, um, with the methods we have available these days, I think um, very much can be done um, simply with unstructured data. In most cases, we will simply have to because um, creating structured data is actually quite expensive because you have to have people to um, to, to code everything, either um, the judges when they're actually writing the judgment or um, the, the documentation, people who receive the judgment from the judges and have to fit that into some kind of format. That takes a lot of time and labor. So um, let's go for the unstructured data. I, I think that'll, that'll um, turn out best. You have more comment. I think you have. If you have a brief comment, uh, please go ahead. We have an extra comment for you, Sean. Can you hear me, Sean? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the great presentation. Uh, so you raised a few uh, juridical qu legal questions. Uh, how do legal concepts evolve? Uh, can we propose new classification for legal concepts? Uh, and then you talked about applications of uh, these data sets you propose uh, via network analysis and uh, geographic analysis, right? Uh, what you try to do here in our group is um, uh, testing different embeddings, you know, of texts and applying machine learning methods. So the question is, have you seen already um, relevant answers to these, I think, very complicated questions uh, using these machine learning techniques? That would not be citation analysis or geographic analysis, using embeddings, for instance. Uh, yeah, I'm actually working on one, but I can't announce it yet because it's still kind of uh, exploding and, and crashing. So <laughs> it, it will probably be very, very interesting once it's done, but uh, I still have some some um, uh, necessities to, to fix the hyperspace. <laughs> okay. Um, though again, um, have a look at the, the paper by Alschner et al, because uh, he included a lot of example papers for different computational methods. So I, I think you will find that very useful um, if you haven't read it before. Okay, awesome, thanks. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Sean, once again. Uh, I, sh I wish we could go further in our debate, but we are uh, running out of time. So thank you once again for sharing your material, your references, and your database, above all. We go uh, further now with the presentation of Julia and Paula, uh, with the 
paper mapping the participation of state and no state actors uh, before the ICJ. Uh, Julia is a researcher here at FGV, Center of Excellence and a Master of Laws of Master of Private International Law, if I'm not mistaken, in Buenos Aires. And Paula, our organizer, super organizer. Julia, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me well? Okay, so um, this is a brief presentation and a humble one because if we compare the methodology of our research with the one just presented by our colleague Shamphob, it is uh, very much more, um, how can I say, classic we have a more classical methodology uh, and I'll be brief because we are running out of time I just wanted to mention that this is one uh, of the many ongoing research projects we have under the supervision of Professor Paulo Almeida at the FGV Center of Excellence and it concerns the paper concerns uh, concerns the mapping of the participants that engage in proceedings before the International kind of, uh, Court of Justice, but it is all part of a bigger project uh, which analyzes the possible avenues for expanding access to international justice. And uh, here I'll focus on the International Court of Justice. So um, I already ta uh, talked about some of these points, but the, the main focus of our paper for this workshop is to to debate as uh, as wa was already debated as sorry uh, as was already debated in the first panel the possibilities and the need to address the issue of expanding participation in the international court of justice and the empirical attempt to draw a map of the participations that are ongoing uh, in the International Court of Justice until this moment. Uh, I will divide my presentation first by uh, introducing very b briefly our humble methodology to you and then showing some of the, the preliminary results we have reached thus far. Um, as I said, this was a humble methodology because it was uh, handmade, man-made. We conducted for around three years a keyword research in the International Court of Justice website database where the, the court has a very organized uh, website in which it posts, it publishes all the material, all the, the procedural material from all contentious cases, which will be a case where a state is uh, litigating uh, against another state, and also the advisory proceedings in which an actor, an international actor, is requesting for the court's opinion on some matter. And we analyzed all documents uh, in contentious and advisory proceedings in International Court of Justice. So the keyword research is not that different from the analysis in the contentious cases to the analysis in advisory proceedings. The difference is that in advisory proceedings, as we'll, be, we'll see in a, in a moment, uh, we only have one uh, legal basis, one main legal basis, and it's all uh, paragraphs of the same article that allows for participation so the the keyword research was much most more focused on keywords and in contentious contentious cases as there are a lot more cases we are talking of around 155 contentious cases and uh, a little bit less of 30 advisory proceedings that we have read entirely so uh, we focus on in contentious cases going back just to to illustrate we focus on the main legal basis for participation which i will also uh, explain a little bit better in a moment i just wanted to highlight uh, on the methodology this uh, differentiation that we drew we classified uh, 
attempts for participation being either formal or infor informal in relation to uh, ha it having a legal basis under which the, the participant, the actor, is uh, trying to, to participate before the court or not, if the actor does not um, um, use a legal basis to, to try and have the, the court's um, um, attention to, to its submission on the matter, and direct and indirect participations, which would be a uh, direct participation would be when one actor uh, directly submits an information or tries to submit an information to the court and an indirect participation will be when uh, an actor uses another actor, for example NGOs, a uh, non-governmental organization, using the states to uh, try and annex their submissions as the annexes of the main submissions by the states. So now I will start uh, going on the, the analysis of our preliminary results. I will start with contentious cases. Here we can see um, this is a general overview of how many participations we were able to map in all those 155 cases and by legal basis. As I said, in contentious cases there are so many more cases and so many more uh, articles from the court's statute and rules of court that can be applied. So we can see here a lot of uh, articles that allowed for participations or attempts for participation. As you can see, we have two uh, bigger uh, uh, data here. The, the bigger one, uh, Article 34.3, with 40 participations, concerns all IDOs, notifications from the courts to the relevant international uh, intergovernmental organizations. And we also have uh, a lot of state intervention under Article 63. Um, and now we'll uh, be able to focus on each one of these. Uh, first, states. Uh, one interesting thing is that, as you can see, the, the highest amount of uh, attempts for participation is uh, in this last column that has 32 participations. I don't know if you can read because maybe my slides have uh, the subtitles are... Uh, small, but I, I can read for you. These are uh, state applications for permission to intervene that are still awaiting the court's decision uh, so as to, for the court to decide if these states uh, can or cannot uh, submit their, their views uh, under the basis of this article. And which, what is interesting is that all those uh, attempts, all those 32 uh, declarations for, of states, uh, we're not there in six months ago because they are all related to the case Ukraine versus Russia in which uh, allegations uh, of violation of the Convention of Genocide are being disputed because of the, the war uh, that is happening between Ukraine and Russia right now. And we have seen um, uh, a mass... Uh, a mass intervention of states, uh, especially European states, that uh, uh, gave um, press releases uh, stating that they w uh, are concerned with the situation in Ukraine, and they also this uh, was also replicated juridically in the case that is ongoing the uh, International Court of Justice. A lot of states have submitted uh, permission to intervene before the court and. The case is still ongoing. It's a very debated case in doctrine. Uh, we, we have also briefly talked about this case in the first panel with the, the speakers we had. So there is a lot to see still concerning this case. The, here we have, um, we were trying to, to map each and every individual declaration of each state when it first started, but in in, in terms of weeks, we were uh, seeing ourselves uh, with the necessity to deal with a lot of 
declarations that were uh, coming in. So now we have a total of 32 declarations. We and for uh, as far as we have been able to analyze all of them or almost all of them, we have seen that the content of these declarations is very similar. But it shows that the the states they were in line uh, among one another uh, in this mass attempt to to intervene before the court. And well, we can. There are a lot of issues that relate to this topic. Here, I, I have to be very brief, and maybe the the letter is still too small in the slides. Now that we are here for a greater audience, but what is important here is to analyze if the, if the International Court of Justice will be able to accept all these interventions and if accepted, if these interventions will impact on the decisions of the court in this ongoing proceeding because um, there are a lot of debate concerning the um, how um, how can I say this? How can I put this? Um, it? Sometimes when proceedings uh, receive a lot of intervention or amicus curi from different um, actors that are not parties to the proceedings, this uh, makes the, the proceedings last longer. Sometimes the, the interest of the, the parties can be affected. There are a lot of debates right now concerning this, this situation that is ongoing. So, um, yeah. And I would very much like to discuss it but I have to go I have to go on I'll just uh, go now to IDOs and I would like to first come to this slide then I'll come back um, we uh, the International Court of Justice has re um, issued a lot of notifications to intergovernmental organizations here we can see that this number however uh, the, the almost the entirety of this number amounts to notifications that were declined by the actors or not answered at all. So these uh, these notifications they did not amount to actual participation of these IGOs in the proceedings. Uh, only in one case we have seen, um, and now I come to this slide. Only in the, the same case, Ukraine versus Russia, we have seen an IDO that has proprio uh, moto, which means that uh, without being notified by the court, this IDO uh, submitted uh, observations concerning the proceedings, and this was a very um, historical moment because this is the first time this article is used at all. And this can pose some questions as regarding um, how uh, how the International Court of Justice is uh, indeed open to these participations and how uh, the actors themselves uh, enjoy th these opportunities or not. Um, now we have also seen uh, four cases that in, in which there were notifications under Article 43 of the Rules of Court, which goes hand in hand with Article 33, uh, Paragraph 3, but this didn't amount to actual participations as well. Uh, now, coming, uh, I would like to, to address very briefly the participation of individuals before the International Court of Justice. Just being very brief, uh, the International Court of Justice is not open to individuals to submit uh, their, own, um, their own views or to participate di directly in the proceedings. But they can serve as experts uh, to the International Court of, Court of Justice. However, in uh, a total of 155 cases, we can see that only in four cases the court uh, requested for the use of expert opinions from individuals. And there is a lot of debate, both in doctrine and also from the, the judges themselves in their separate opinions from some decisions, that the court could have been more active as regards to the use the court makes to Article 50 and the possibility to hear technical, specialized individuals in complex cases. Um, yeah, and there was only one attempt in 1950 of one 
NGO, non-governmental organization, that tried to to access the the court to submit its observations, but the at that moment the court fixed uh, its understanding that only public international organizations could be participants in contentious cases. So the request was denied, and ever since no NGO uh, attempted to participate again. Uh, because of this uh, small overture the, the of the, the international court in contentious cases, we have been able to map a lot of informal participations, which are participations that are not based on the statutes and rules of court, and sometimes that use uh, indirect means to accede to the court. For example, I'll just uh, pick to exemplify the case Gabsikovo Nagimaros, in which we have seen a lot of NGOs and also IGOs and some uh, expert individuals that submitted it, their observations as annexes to both uh, the Hungarian and Slovakian um, um, memorandum for the court. Now, I'll be very brief to as to address advisory proceedings, which are the proceedings. Uh, they, there are no, uh, there are no two parties, one against each other in advisory proceedings. It is a pr uh, proceeding in which an international organization asks for the opinion of the court on on, in, uh, on a matter of international law. In these cases, we have uh, um, we have more broadened avenues for participation before the court because uh, there are not uh, there is not a sentence um, a final award that is going to be binding uh, between the parties to the proceedings so uh, these proceedings are a little more open and as as we can see a lot of states although states are not parties to these proceedings have participated, being the actor that stands out as the, m the, the one with most uh, submissions issued to the court in advisory proceedings. Uh, and here we can see that some of the cases that generated the most, uh, the, the biggest an amount of participations are, first, the wall case concerning the, the wall that was constructed in Palestine in Israeli territory, and also the the uh, um, the advisory opinion that uh, concerns the in the uh, declaration of independence of the state or the territory of Kosovo. So we can see that these proceedings have sometimes, very often, um, political uh, issues related to the juridical questions and also matters of community interest, as were discussed in the first panel. Um, here, as I said before, uh, indirect participations are those that use other participants' uh, submissions uh, to, to submit information to the court, and we have seen a lot of indirect participations in advisory proceedings. What is interesting is that we have seen uh, as a form of co uh, formal official quotation from the court this expression, on behalf of and we have seen a lot of um, submissions that were made, for example, by states on behalf of IGOs or um, on behalf of individuals or uh, by IGOs also on behalf of individuals. This is a form of indirect and informal participation that is uh, very often used by the court and not as so often uh, discussed by the doctrine. doctrine especially because there are not many pr uh, proced procedural rules that uh, address it formally. Um, and here, those are very interesting numbers that are, uh, concern the, our, the biggest research we are conducting, but maybe I will ask you be to your conclusion, more please. brief, I can go on. <laughs> I would just like to yeah, I'd just like to, to address two uh, last points and then uh, I'll wrap up. The first one being this practice direction number 12, which is um, a rule of court, but not a, let's say, this is uh, a procedural rule 
that the International Court of Justice has to conduct its proceeding, but it's not a uh, part of the ICJ's statute, which would be a treaty and uh, harder to to amend or to to uh, change. This practice direction was issued in 1996 in the in the occurrence of one of these cases, the nuclear weapons case, and it uh, broadens the the avenues for participation in advisory proceedings. Interesting though, this has never been used so far. So again, I would like to highlight this uh, important message that uh, in one side, the International Court of Justice has uh, narrow uh, procedural rules, but also the actors are not, uh, as we have seen in our research, the actors are, are not so, um, they, they do not seek to use uh, as much these opportunities that are given for them to participate before the court and have their opinions being heard. And now, maybe this will change, we have two new advisory proceeding cases that you, you can uh, afterwards uh, Google and search more information about because they, they came in this year and one is a revision of the wall opinion. So again, we are going to discuss the, the construction of the wall in Palestinian territory. And the other one is a case that concerns climate change litigation for the first time being heard in the International Court of Justice. And yes, so many NGOs are involved in the submission of this case to the ICJ. Maybe we'll see uh, a more active use of these proceedings in these cases. With this, I'll wrap up because this, uh, this is our open conclusion about the challenges and alternatives that can be seen in the future. <laughs> Thank you, Julia, for your presentation. I'm sure your data shows this uh, tension, this growing tension between the bilateral nature of disputes and the wider community interests. You mentioned twice that your your uh, methodology was humble. Uh, I, con I consider every effort of using um, empirical methodology in law groundbreaking, especially uh, speaking from where we speak in Brazil. So congratulations, and I'm sure your presentation opened up uh, many uh, ways and research questions for our audience, they could greatly benefit from your from your presentation. Paulo, would you like to add something before we go further? Thank you. Oh, just to thank Julia because I, I think she presented perfectly our research and uh, it's very difficult to condense all the arguments and the the, uh, the figures that we prepared. Um, uh, of course, that we we uh, as most of you we are we have our background in law, and we are not necessarily trained <laughs> to do in, to work with empirical methods and to work with large databases. So this is something that we are learning. We're in the process of learning, and when we um, when we thought about this uh, about this workshop, we thought that it would be interesting to have a specific panel. This is now panel two. Uh, on methods, because this is something that we have to learn, and uh, and not only from people from, uh, with law background, but also from mathematicians that know they they are working with natural language processing, and they know uh, how can we go forward? Because sometimes we, as lawyers, we we go through the database with keywords, and uh, we end up having. Uh, figures and uh, we don't know how to move forward because we sometimes it's difficult to measure and this is also a question here measure influence just on the basis of citations so so it could be interesting to apply uh, different methods uh, while you you while doing research in law so that we can go further and evaluate really evaluate the proximity between the texts and try to 
apply, for example, natural language processing to uh, the study not only of international courts but also of international organizations. So this is an effort we are undertaking here in the auspices of the Center of Excellence. We have uh, one research project based on the on the ICJ specifically, another one uh, that is going to be presented by Pedro and, and Rodrigo on investment arbitration. And we are also developing another project on the international organizations on the, on the uh, WHO and the application of w implementation of WHO norms in, in Brazil. Uh, and Hiki is also part of this project and Rafael as well is working with us. Uh, Lucas and José Luis, so I, you know, I need help. I, need, I really need help because I'm in the process of learning all this stuff and this is really um, difficult sometimes for us when we are not used to work with different database and, and with, uh, uh, with empirical methods. So they are, they, are, they are working with database at the FGV Law School and uh, Enrique and Rafael are working at the AMAPI, the School of Mathematics. Uh, and we are getting together to learn from each other and to share different ways of doing research in law. So this is why I wanted to explain a little bit the intention of forming this panel, because we are all here learning together. So thank you so much, Julia. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. As our time is short, with no further delay, I would invite uh, Pedro Jatene, Larry and Rodrigo Belotti to present the paper Arbitrating Public Disputes in Private Tribunals, the Interplay Between Global Public Goods and Amitikuri in ISSID Proceedings. Uh, Pedro and Rodrigo are both researchers at the Centre of Excellence here at FGV. Please, Pedro. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, um, everyone. Um, we will be presenting our work on investment arbitration concerning uh, arbitrating public disputes in private tribunals, which is a core challenge of international investment arbitration. I don't know how many of you were here at uh, Professor uh, Arroyo's um, presentation on the morning. I will first briefly present the challenge that lay before the lays before us, and then Rodrigo will comment a little bit further on our research. So, w with no uh, further ado, international investment arbitration presents a fundamental question, which is: it derives from international commercial arbitration. A deal, a, a, a manner of settling disputes between private parties, which is generally known for confidentiality or a lack of transparency in general, and it is seen as an advantage of this means of settling disputes. However, international investment arbitration sometimes deals with matters which relate to public policy or public interest. Therefore, a conflict is created between the procedural framework of international investment arbitration and the need to tackle matters which go beyond the parties to this proceeding. So, one of the solutions uh, scholarly references uh, point to is the role of amicus curiae, amicus curiae being the participation of non uh, disputing party actors in the proceedings. And these amicus curiae would be able to carry considerations of public interest to disputes between a state and an investor company. Therefore, the, the consideration today is before us is whether or not um, non-state actors and um, non-party actors in these proceedings can contribute to uh, the need uh, to promote public interest in this uh, framework. So our investigation is to relate non-disputing party participation and the uh, uh, dealing with global public goods in international investment arbitration. Our theoretical framework um, 
starts from the practice of arbitral tribunals, which from the early 2000s started accepting the participation of amicus curiae in international investment arbitration. Initially, that participation was not based on any specific provision of uh, the rules applying to those arbitrations, but rather on a broad procedural mandate uh, which arbitrators possess as to the procedural rules of the disputes. Uh, the first attempt of um, non-party participation in exit disputes happened in the Aguas del Tunari case in 2003, and it was denied. Some years later, in the Suez and Vivendi versus Argentina instance, it was the first instant, instance it was accepted, exactly because of that broad procedural mandate um, inscribed on Article 44 of the Exit Convention. As a development of the practice which started in the tribunals, a rule was amended in 2006 to the exit arbitration rules and a specific procedure for accepting amicus curiae participation was installed in exit tribunals, which is rule 37, para 2 of the exit arbitration rules, and it contains some, though not all of the requirements arbitrators must consider when assessing the utility and the pertinence of a uh, contribution or a submission by an amicus curiae. Therefore, what I can summarize to you is that there are three avenues for non-disputing party participation in exit proceedings. One is provisions in investment treaties. For example, the NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, uh, contains Article 1,198, which is a very common means of accepting the amicus curiae participation of the NAFTA states in the interpretation of the treaty. The other I've just mentioned is the Exit Rule 37, Para 2, which uh, provides for the submission of written briefs by amicus curiae and there are other um, participatory rights which may be uh, conferred upon uh, petitioners, including the access to arbitral documents and the attending of hearings. And those arrive from an interpretation of Rule 37, Para 2, and also from the broad procedural mandate uh, contained in Article 30, uh, 44. Now, as to the methodology of our research, I would like to uh, uh, give the floor to my colleague, Rodrigo, so that he may comment on it. Uh, thank you very much. So, basically, what we can see is, we're basic when we started the research, we were trying to unfold what is the role of transparency in investment arbitration, and how external or non-state parties and these non-disputing parties may participate how they can participate, to what extent they can join or be a part of this proceedings, and most substantially, as, as was the um, topic of the paper that we submitted, under what cases, under what circumstances, and to address which particular global public goods or matters of public interest in uh, general. That's better. So to start with our methodology, and uh, as Judith stated that her methodology was humble, ours then is childish at best. Um, so this was a modest, a very humble also attempt to figuring out how what are the levels of transparency and external participation in non-disputing parties and investment arbitration in general. Um, so we began by searching for um, databases and official websites where we could find information. Obviously we looked at the case files of ICSID, uh, the main body for judging and ruling over investment disputes. But there is also a very key piece of, um, a very key website called ITA Law that works in harmony and in conjunction with uh, the UN Commission on Trade. And it actually groups together different types of cases by topic. One of these topics, and uh, updated to 2023, was Amici Kuriai participation. So we were able to model and to at least start our investigation by looking at those cases. And when we got those cases, we looked at the reference, the parties, um, the years, the origins, what was actually involved. 
And then we looked at the applications or the documents related to non-disputing party participation. There, uh, this word is utilized interchangeably with third party participation, external party participation, or Michi Kuriai in general. So we were searching for um, documents that demonstrated this type of participation. Um, we looked at the different requests that the Amici potentially made. There were, as we're going to see, there were different types of um, issues that the non-disputing party could potentially raise. The decisions for these applications and the specific requests. Then we got the submissions and the year of these submissions, that the, the actual written briefs that were submitted. Um, and then we understood who was um, um, submitting the said brief or participating, what type of actor was it a state actor, a non-state actor, an IGO, that is an intergovernmental organization? And last, but certainly not least, we looked at the cases themselves. What were the cases addressing? Were there any public good adjacent, adjacent um, to the disputes or um, that played an incidental role in the main controversy at play? There we go. So just to contextualize, and I'm going to move through this um, um, quite quickly. Um, to get to the part of global public goods. But when we were um, collecting our databases, in general, and this is not written on the slides, we were able to get a total of 51 cases. Of these 51 cases, we looked at 86 different petitions from different actors, states and non-states. Of these 86 petitions to participate, 45 of them came from either IGOs or non-state actors. And um, of these 45 petitions, when we looked at the actors themselves, that gets to these, this part of the slide, 76 of them were non-state actors. The reason for such a high number is that on several occasions, we would have one petition being jointly submitted by different actors. It was actually the case on several different occasions. And uh, three IGOs. So this helps us understand where we're at, what we're looking at. We have, um, even though... 42.8% of all of the actors particip per participating and petitioning are state actors um, in the form of national governments. We also have a substantial level of participation from different types of non-state actors. We included in our individual assessment of what we did, civil society organizations, which are CSOs, indigenous tribes, individuals, and uh, in some cases we were not um, perfectly capable of understanding who was submitting, um, given, Pedro said, um, there are levels of confidentiality in certain proceedings, so we were barred from understanding what was happening in those cases. So we placed as unknown. Yes. Then we looked at the, uh, the concept of non-state actors versus state actors that is brought by the International Law Association in its last report that was from 2016, if I'm not mistaken, that gives us this residual or three-layer definition of state actors, non-state actors, and IGOs. IGOs, of course, are not state actors, given that they, they're a collective body of different states, which share, share different characteristics from what is ordinarily known as a non-state actor. So given this residual um, interpretation, we have a, a very big division of state versus non-state, which is pretty good for the results that we found considering the advances of, of transparency. We, all, we were also able to map the submissions and the different types of participations over the years. Um, to us, it seemed quite steady, and there were particular spikes that, were, that are worthy of mentioning. For example, after 20, 2006, with the Suez and Vivendi case, there were a couple of submissions that seemed not, uh, noticeable and relevant um, for the appreciation of ICSID. And most notably, there is in 2016 a quite a high spike of 12 different cases. But that, um, from our research, it, it basically came from one single case that was Eli Lilly versus Canada that had incredibly nine different petitions to participate from different kinds of actors. This is also the decisions for the different types of requests that um, a non-state actor or a non-disputing party may actually request. There were four different requests that were made. Um, the request to file a brief, the request to access documents of the case, to participate in the hearings and have the right to voice their opinions, 
And uh, there was also a couple of requests to actually become a, one of the parties of the proceedings, for example, um, a joinder or um, one of those types of, of issues. And uh, the decisions, I think it's on the next. The decisions were also um, a little bit scattered. Um, access to documents were more consistent in the results of what was actually um, deferred and not deferred and granted and not granted. What we found from the research was that in the other complementary rights to participation, there is some variance in the results. Um, so we still see ICSID a little bit resistance in, for example, granting access to documents, which is something that is rather sensitive to the, the to several disputes which may or may not be confidential at a certain level. Um, this is also uh, different decisions over the years. As we can see, 2016 was a very big year because of the that single Eli Lilly versus Canada case that had several different submissions with decisions, with mixed decisions as well. And this leads us to one of the final parts of our research, which was given all of the 51 cases where we had non-disputing parties and non-state actors participating, what were the goods that were at stake? What topic, what public policy or public issue matter that was adjacent to the disputes or which played a role in the considerations of the tribunal. We utilized um, the conception and the, um, the, the vision that was brought by professors Mendoza and Kaul concerning 13 different types of global public goods which stem from access to land, to the environment, to healthcare, to water related rights. We were very systematic in our approach because what we found was when always when we analyze the, the request to arbitration or the decision or different files of that particular case, there was always something that was adjacent to what the parties were submitting and strictly related to uh, the final decision or the main issues that were being discussed um, at the case. And here we, we analyzed uh, from among the Amicus Curiae instances uh, w how many of which actually dealt with global public goods. And we can see that a startling majority of them actually deal with global public goods. And uh, that we will analyze specifically which global public goods are to be found in, this, in these disputes. Yes, um, starting to the left, um, the blue diagram it, and the blue um, graph sort of displays the difference, um, the scattering of the, of the different goods that are portrayed across all of the cases. Obviously, the environment and water-related rights were very crucial in our analysis and all of the results that we were able to find. And uh, just to conclude with the types of actors involved in all of these cases and in all of these global public goods, what we found was that state actor participation was quite consistent throughout all of the goods because what they did was to limit their analysis to the interpretation of a treaty or a legal norm um, whereas opposed to non-state actors or IGOs for example they usually rose when we were dealing with particular global public goods in this case we had the environment we had healthcare we had water related rights um, which was quite interesting for our results Yes, uh, Rodrigo has already advanced some of our conclusions that most requests for participation beyond written submissions are denied, perhaps because of Rule 37.2 of the exit rules. Um, most instances of amicus curiae participation actually deal in some way or another with a global public good, and non-state uh, participation is more frequent uh, if a global public good is concerned. But states are common throughout, and they are especially common for the interpretation of treaties, uh, even if a global public good is not at stake. Environment and healthcare were the most frequent global public goods, or actually the one was which attracted most attention. And we would like to raise with a question that was perhaps spoiled uh, in the, the earlier uh, which is what is the actual influence these submissions have in the uh, making up of the uh, arbitrator's minds and if I may somewhat give an answer to uh, that question scholarly references actually point out that arbitrators are 
quite silent in, in addressing the Amicus Curiae submissions which were handed to them. We don't know if they are influenced by them or not, but we know they rarely um, mention them in the arbitral awards. We actually tried to figure out to what extent um, the submission or the petition played a role in the decision-making process of the tribunal, but it was very hard. Very hard, and we ended up sort of scattering away from the project as a whole. <laughs> yeah. Maybe the next step um, of other research, yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> perhaps you can teach us that. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Pedro and Rodrigo, thank you for your presentation. It was very insightful. I feel at a page with insights from your presentations. And uh, I'll, I'll just briefly comment to uh, aspects that are interesting of the many aspects, uh, interesting aspects of your presentation. One is uh, I would recommend you to think about interplay between the participation of non-disputing parties and third-party funding and economic interest behind uh, those participations. That there you might have something interesting to think. And thinking on the overall ISDS system, one of the main arguments behind ISDS system was the depolitization of disputes. And we heard today earlier Diego telling us that sometimes when you have a very uh, uh, activist uh, memorandum, they might not be accepted. So maybe third party or uh, participation, non-disputing non party participation is repoliticizing disputes, which would be undesired by the system or is the system to be politicized. So this is a wider question of uh, I asked the assistant that might want to address on your papers, and then I have a lot of the ideas that I share with you afterwards. I'll pass the floor to our commentators. Lucas, please go ahead. Well, Pedro and Rodrigo, I have to say, I really enjoyed reading uh, the text that you submitted to us. Um, I'm going to comment your paper together with José, but I would like to say that me, José, Henrique, and Rafael, we all talked about all papers, and we came together, and we found some common ideas that we all shared about the papers. So in some, some sense, I'm also reflecting the analysis of Henrique and Rafael, uh, who are not going to speak to your paper specific specifically. So our role here is probably to comment most uh, uh, on the methodology because it is where we can perhaps help most the papers and, and we all understand that uh, people from a legal background, uh, as is being said here, uh, they don't really know how to utilize empirical research. It's something new, it's something very important, so we, we thought we could help them achieve this in some way, at least help them organize uh, in their heads how, how we should think about methodology of empirical research. So my idea here, uh, the main comment I have about your paper, uh, the text that you submitted, uh, I know it's not the finished text, but the text that you submitted, is that you presented the methodology very briefly and very objectively, but it's actually important to critically analyze the limitations of the methodology employed, and that you have not done. So how can we do that? How can we uh, critically analyze the methodology? So I'm going to propose three ideas, three principles, that I think are really helpful to do that. It is easy to understand, and it, you can organize your, your analysis around those three principles. So the first one is the principle of representativeness. So the first thing, if you're using empirical research and quantitative methods, the first thing you have to consider is the data collection process. And you have to analyze if uh, the data that you collected, collected is representative of the phenomenon you want to study. So that phenomenon, let's, let's simplify and think we're, we're talking about a, a pizza. So there is a huge pizza there, but you cannot grab it all to analyze. You have to take a slice. So we want a, a slice that has the same distribution of toppings that you actually have in, the, in, the, in reality. 
right? If you slice, you, if you have a slice that only has the crust of the pizza, the conclusions you're going to arrive about the pizza are not the same if you have the whole pizza with all the toppings. So it's a, it's a metaphor, obviously, but it's a, an easy way to think about this. So you collect these 51 cases, but you really didn't told us if there are more cases, uh, if you think that might be some sort of bias in the way those cases were selected, um, and if you can arrive at more general conclusions from those 51 cases. This, this is something that is important to be considered when you're discussing empirical methodology. The second principle is the principle of reliability. So reliability is actually the precision of the measure you're, you're taking. So you have to consider if the data is correct. Uh, in some cases, when you take data from different sources, there may be conflicts about in the data. And you have to be very honest with, uh, with your, your research and say, well, we are not 100% sure that this source is actually correct. But this is particularly important when you do cl manual classification of data. Because then you are the source, you are the measurement. So you have to convince the audience or the, your readers that uh, your measure is objective enough so that if, other, if another person were to do the same classification, they would arrive at roughly the same results. The way we do that is either two different researchers uh, do the classification separately and then they compare results and see how much they agreed on the classifications, which is called a blind review, or we have to be very, make a big effort to make our research reproducible so that all other researchers uh, may uh, try to do the same thing and see if they arrive at the same result. So those are the two strategies. The first one is better because don't, you're not relying on other researchers, but if you cannot do that, you can at least make the research reproducible. And finally, and this is perhaps the most important one, is the problem of validity. So validity is, I, I have a measure that I'm, I'm, I'm taking from reality. What is the relationship between that measure and the actual concept that I'm investigating? So perhaps I'm going to investigate, investigate the level of, of um, how affluence in a society and I'm taking income as a measure. There are a lot of uh, things that affect income and there is a difference between measuring income and, and the actual uh, purchase power of income. So I have to make a lot of considerations about how much that measure is actually ref reflecting what I want to measure. So here, because you're studying amicus curiae and their participation, uh, you're using indirect measures, uh, a submission they made, if it was uh, accepted or not. So you have to consider what does that mean, because what you actually want to measure or talk about is participation, it's not the submission. So what's the relationship between the submission and, and the actual participation? Eventually, we would arrive at the problem of the actual influence, because that's what <laughs> we actually want to wanna, wanna measure, but this is a much harder discussion that you don't necessarily have to face in, in this research. So those three principles, I think they're really useful. I don't, I don't think many, many people working in researching in legal empirical research know about them, but they're really useful. Uh, so this is the main point that I wanted to make, uh, but more concretely about the topic of your paper, I would just w like to point out that those problems of transparency that you presented in the beginning of, the, uh, of your talk today, uh, they are not very well explored in the beginning of the paper. So it is crucial to the paper because we are saying that amicus curiae is a way to deal with this problem, but you don't actually discuss what, what kinds of information are available and are not available, should be available. I, I know that, for example, Brazilian diplomats have criticized uh, investment arbitrations because certain types of information are not available. For example, how much uh, investors have uh, gained, how much, what are the value of the arbitration, how much the, the lawyers cost, and, and, and things like that have been criticized. So perhaps a bigger discussion of what 
the lack of transparency is, what the problem of transparency is, not only because it is important to the topic you're discussing and you can present it in the end and come back at the, present in the beginning and come back at the end, but also because this problem of transparency actually <laughs> it affects your methodology. You said it yourself that you had problems to obtain um, the, the the group of certain people who participated because uh, you had you didn't have access to certain documents or to certain information. So transparency here is not only the topic that you're discussing, but it's also a methodological uh, limitation of the paper. So those are my comments. Thank you very much, Professor. So just to add a few more points, and, and picking up uh, from one of the principles, I, I mean, we love principles in law, I guess, uh, Lucas said, uh, on validity, uh, Shen commented that uh, citations are not a perfect ma way to measure the word of the day, I guess, which is influence. So, I mean, how valid is it for us to measure influence simply because you cited something? Like, it does not necessarily mean you use that to reach your decision, but... On another way, it's why you make transparency of your decision. It's everything you ha use to justify it. Uh, it's what's on paper or in oral arguments sometimes. Uh, and that's even less accessible in terms of data than uh, decision text. Uh, and on the topic of annotation and when you you yourself as a group or a research group uh, is collecting and classifying the data, uh, you can look at inter-rater agreement, which is considered, at least for publication uh, standards, the kind of uh, golden uh, standard. Uh, so you compare everyone that if s multiple people uh, classify the same information, it's a statistical way to compare everything and if people are uh, understanding and classifying the information uh, in a way as if it was the same person. So everyone is applying the same concepts uh, in a certain way. So that's considered uh, not without its faults the golden standard, for at least for publication, both in qualitative and in quantitative uh, research. Uh, a brief point uh, on the paper, you, as your hypothesis on the introduction, you say you're measuring the correlation. And I mean, th this is really small, but uh, it's well written overall uh, and you can just add a few things here and there, so this is a small point, but correlation implies a specific time type of statistical relation. So I would, would just change this to relation to, to use a broader term. Uh, I'm not sure if Enrique and Rafa would agree with this, but I, I think it's fair, at, especially if you are dialoguing with a quantitative, quantitative um, audience and they're used to statistical research, that they're used to correlation, so, th so they might expect something else. That, that That's the problem. Uh, and a uh, few brief comments. Uh, in addition to your methodology as analysis and data collection, I think you should also think about how you present your results. So uh, a lot of your presentation revolved around plots and, and graphs, and that was also an important part of the, the paper. And I think um, when we are at the final stage, uh, when you were writing the paper and you when you're composing the presentation, I think every decision you make regarding a plot should be explicit. So think about everything. So the order of the columns, uh, there should be a meaning behind that. Don't don't let this be random due to whatever program you're using to plot. Uh, if you're making a bar plot and you're dividing it on multiple information, do you need all this information on the same plot? Should it be different plots? So uh, on the paper, I think on the second part of the data analysis, you comment uh, on the on different cases on the public goods from government and non-governmental uh, entities and what they took part. But it, there's only a single plot with uh, with uh, different bars. They are not stacked. Uh, but maybe uh, it's easier and it makes uh, easier for whoever is reading to have different plots. So if you're talking separately about governmental. Uh, contribution to public good cases, you can make a smaller and simpler plot only with this data and then you proceed to non-government, so individual or uh, multilateral organizations, I don't know, uh, you make another plot and you have a self-contained plot that has a clear message. So this is, uh, I think, uh, if we, I had to add a, a certain kind of principle as it's not really a principle, but you should think uh, what's the message behind each plot. So each plot should have a clear message uh, if you're including that in your final text. 
Thank you very much, Professor. We'll be sure to include all these contributions yep. before we, we move on with our paper. Yeah, thank you very much, very much. <laughs> yeah, we, we will, will try. try. Thank you, Lucas. We'll humbly try. No? And José Luis for your comments. Thank you, uh, you and Pedro, for your presentation. I think our commentators tackled some of the questions, of very interesting questions for us. I'm taking notice of, of the suggestions here. They are tackling some very important questions, such as the objectivity of measures and how we deal with this objectivity when we have to classify uh, the sources that we use in law, which are mainly tax sources, and we have thematic areas. So many of those concerns are appearing here in our in our session. Let's move ahead. We now have the presentation. I invite Marcus Schubert and Fabio Braga are joining us online. Are they there? Yeah. Uh, Marcus Schubert and, and Fabio Braga are presenting the paper Transjudicial Communication Between Human Rights Courts and Dialogue, Paving a Way for a New Institutional Approach. Marcus is a, a visiting researcher at the University of Toronto and a PhD candidate in human rights and democracy at the Federal University of Paraná. And Fabio Braga is a visiting researcher at Oklahoma University and a PhD candidate at the human rights and democracy program also at the Federal University of Paraná. So Fabio and Marcus, thank you. The floor is yours. Hi, nice to meet you guys. Can you list me? Hello. Yeah. Yes. Can you listen? Uh, Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Let me. Uh, so, um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this subject. Um, it's part of our research, and it's. Um, we will have a brief uh, presentation to put the points to debate and to think more about not just the case but the methodology. So it's important to think about how perspective uh, we have to show to, to you in this presentation. So um, a brief context about this paper, it's about uh, how we can discover a new way uh, to, to think about the connections in the international law. So the regimes and the institutions, how we can uh, think in a way to uh, express new ideas about uh, a possibly new institutional approach. So the idea is um, think based in some cases, especially in indigenous rights, to think uh, what this case can not press, but what, what, what they can offer to think about these connections. So, um, Marcus? Okay, uh, you can move on, Fabio. Uh, yes. So, uh, uh, our research uh, is about transjudicial communication. So, I'm focusing on citation. Yeah, I, I think after every uh, presentation that we've seen here today, it's like uh, it's not actually a good way to start. But I think it's interesting to uh, explore citation on our uh, case. Uh, because of a perspective uh, on uh, Aboriginal law, right? But I'm not going to spoil it. So, first of all, a context from global, to, from local to global. Uh, you can move on, Fabio. It's actually pretty interesting because uh, most of our draft, uh, we've been uh, talking about the, the idea of fragmentation of international law, the idea of judicial. Uh, uh, dialogue and uh, supposed harmonization of international law. And it's uh, actually these same topics were approached by Professor Laurence Boisson de Chazouns earlier, and it made me really happy that you talked about these topics. Uh, so first, we have the, uh, the idea of multipolarity after the Cold War, uh, the 
non-uniform expansion of international law and suspicion and fear with the arrival of new international organizations and what it could mean for international law. Fabio, we can move on. Uh, this is all context, but I, I, I thought it was very interesting, the conclusions from uh, these two professors of mine, Professor Renato Caldera Branchi and, uh, and Delbert Laji, that this element does not necessarily is a threat to the entire construct of law. It merely shows the political force behind each agenda of international law. And this analysis also indicates that the focus should be not necessarily about how each court tribunal international law organ treats law, but how they interact with each other. This process contributes to the sedimentation of good practices in international law, reinforcing the system and its legitimacy. Uh, you can move on, Fabio. So, uh, this new plurality in international law can be approached from a new perspective that interactions between diverse institutions can be used in a way for improving the regulation and harmonization in international law. So our focus here will be on the idea of jurisprudential commerce, information exchange, and dialogue, right? So that's why we chose Emmanuel Slaughter uh, from a few of our uh, initial citations. And uh, since we will be also focusing in international human rights law, uh, other actor who uh, tries to define and conceptualize dialogue, it's uh, Eduardo Ferrer Magregor. So you can move on, Fabio. So, but what is dialogue? What are we talking about when we are talking about dialogue between international judges? And it's a very hard concept to give because uh, what the, the focal point that the authors seem to uh, agree is that more than the mere application of comparative law, the dialogue put, uh, puts an emphasis on how the role taken by each actor, uh, the uses of terms and the flow of information Right. International courts represent a, mo a moment of great verticalization of international law, that it is when both interpretation and application of non judicial authority come together. We can move on, Fabio. So this is our context until now, uh, about our considerations about the dialogue, please move on. So we are mostly talking about the exchange of ideas and the, uh, we are uh, stepping out of this global community of courts uh, as, you know, a uh, start point. So we are moving in a set of ideas and common goals which represent a new frontier uh, and the organization of judicial powers. So with an emphasis on the flow of ideas and information, the dialogue is usually predominantly informal, according to uh, legal scholars. It can be explicit uh, with uh, citation, but also can be implicit, according to some scholars as well, uh, with the flow of ideas coming from a citation of a citation of other means. And this is this offers a great challenge when we approach it, uh, analyzing uh, citations and cases, because it is absolutely hard, very difficult to see where the ideas are coming from. Right. So uh, we can move on, Fabio. So. Uh, a few common arguments about the jurisprudential commerce is that the search for new arguments, perspective, and new, uh, and new evidence supporting previous arguments, among other factors, inform the jurisprudential commerce. And also that following this argument, variations on the interpretation of international norms may cause a devastating impact on the international law system, undermining its reliability and credibility. So the Hence, the idea that the system needs harmonization or that the judges would act on some sort of teamwork to achieve it. You can move on, Fabio. So, uh, move on. We can enter the Aboriginal law section. Can I just compliment here, Marcos? Hmm? Oh. Uh, so, in this third part, uh, um, the idea is why Aboriginal law? It's because it's connected with the human rights and it's a. Uh, uh, a field that we can, uh, it's not more ease, but the human rights has this idea 
uh, of connections and to think about uh, different realities from Brazil to Mexico and other countries in the world. So it's an um, um, important subject that connects our uh, courts, for example. Right. So the idea of dialogue between international human rights courts and also the other organs such as the commissions is that uh, without entering too much in that on um, that old debate of universalism versus localism, the regional uh, human rights systems they have these uh, approach on plurality, right, on its own nature, um, and also it is not uncommon to see that the uh, regional human rights systems tend to develop their own uh, set of uh, rules and procedures uh, trying to achieve local needs. So, uh, our approach was uh, the Ron Herschel's prototypical cases approach, which is a comparative law methodology. And I have to uh, say here that if <laughs> if Julia's was if Julia's methodology previously was humble, our in the previous article methodology uh, was childish. Our methodology it's probably at a nursery right now, but actually it I think it serves us right because we uh, this the set of cases that we analyzed. Uh, we focus on the right to development and on a specific set of cases, which are very few cases, by African Court of, Inter of uh, Human and People's Rights and also African Commission on Human and People's Rights. So, but a comparative method, it, is it applicable to international courts? It is when they possess a constitutional element deriving from plural, as, uh, as a few authors put in. Uh, also, it it represents it may represent a, a turning point from a positivist uh, approach to a cultural hermeneutics approach when we are uh, comparing human rights uh, and human rights procedures in international human rights courts. And also, uh, why choose the African Charter of Human and People's Rights? Because it was it has a unique approach to the right to development. Uh, it, it's, it's present uh, in the African Charter of Human and People's Rights. Uh, it's the only instrument if, uh, uh, that is not the uh, Declaration of the Right to Develop from 1986 and also the Vienna Convention of 1993 that uh, makes reference to the right of development. And the jurisprudence and doctrine plays uh, an special, they, they both have a special role in the African system according to Article 60 and 61 of the Charter. You can won't have it. But so, and why to, uh, why to, and uh, why we should analyze or pay attention to human rights courts when uh, we are talking about dialogue and we are uh, examining their citations? Because the, first of all, we have the idea that international human rights law must pass through plurality, permeability, permeability, and must be some sort of open-endedness in a welcoming manner to the international community. And also, I've mentioned the uh, debate of uh, regional approaches trying to adapt the idea of an universal to local, right? And also, uh, recently, uh, we have some major... Oh, we can we also have some. We also had some major developments about the idea of citation and jurisprudential studies between international human rights systems, because first of all, they all shared some. Uh, uh, they all drew from. Uh, well, uh, they all come from common ground. They have uh, similar uh, similarities in their structural design. Uh, and even though they evolved differently according to their preferences and their regions, they still have enjoyed good relationships with one another. And uh, recently, uh, at 2018, we have the uh, memorandum that was signed by the three presidents of the International Human Rights Force, the Declaration of San Jose. Mm -hmm. And in uh, 2019, we had also the Declaration of Kampala. 
those memoranda, uh, they address a, a, compro a, a new compromise of the, of the uh, international human rights system to increase their jurisprudential studies, uh, in also increase their uh, exchange of staff, and to conduct uh, biannual studies uh, and colloquies where the judges would meet and discuss results of their uh, most important cases and try to expose it to the public, right? So, what we have here is an attempt on institutionalization of the dialogue. I'm not talking, uh, I won't talk about the institutionalization of citation, but those are uh, political elements that are trying to fix these gaps uh, of, uh, that, that we have on the idea, on where does the ideas and where does the, uh, where does the influence comes from in international law. And uh, our draft, it, it addresses the right to development in a specific set of cases before those declarations. And uh, our objective on the long term is to approach the same set of rights of Aboriginal law uh, before the declaration of Kampala to assess if, uh, if it had any impact, a uh, perceivable impact on the uh, dialogue between international human rights courts and commissions. So, first of all, uh, we need to analyze the dorsal spine of the Inter-American case law, which was uh, crucial to the development of the right to development from uh, African human rights system. So, first case, uh, in, it's Mayana Agostini versus Nicaragua. It's uh, pretty much uh, the most important case regarding indigenous uh, human rights in the uh, inter-American system. Because Marcus and Fabio, I'd just like to ask you to summarize. We are running out of time. Our time is short. Okay, okay. okay so Mayana Agostini has a major impact on in, into the inter-American system. It was cited uh, by the inter-American court in lots of cases, and uh, especially in the Moyana case, the Yakia Aqua, Yakia Aqua indigenous community case. And it all starts to uh, sediment uh, and form the idea of in the paradigm of indigenous people's rights in the inter-American system. Okay. And what happens okay. is that uh, the African system is uh, regard it's regarded as it's too incipient. It developed from a dialogue uh, with the inter-American system. Uh, the first case that is important regarding the right to development case is the Ogoni case from my, uh, 2001, uh, uh, Serac CSR versus Nigeria. Well, since it's the first case, uh, the African Commission uh, decided not to include the right to development explicitly in this case, but it approached it uh, peripherally, perhaps, and it's interesting because both references uh, that the Ogoni case, uh, the, the commission made in the Ogoni case, were drawn from among the first works of each uh, international human rights system. It was cited. I think it was deliberately because politically it was a moment of uh, of delicate balance to the to the African Commission. But then we can see that it developed in when we analyzed the uh, the Endora case from 2009. Uh, in this case, we have that the uh, that the uh, African Commission approached the right to development for the first time, and it had to draw its inspiration from somewhere. And it chooses the Inter-American Human Rights Courts, most uh, specifically the, in the Aboriginal law that started with the Moiwana community case versus Suriname. And it makes reference to in each, uh, of each part of the, their consideration about right to development, drawing inspiration from different cases. The Moiwana community was uh, a reference to the indigenous nature of the community of the Endoroa. 
the Salamaca people cases versus Suriname, you made references to the uh, idea that they uh, of the uh, special special relationship that indigenous people enjoy with the land. And also, Yaki Aksa uh, makes references to the right of these people to uh, be uh, protected under a special regime and so on. So it was a very fruitful relationship in the Andorra case. And it's interesting to note that the first case that the African court uh, received about right to development uh, and still about uh, Aboriginal law didn't have, uh, didn't actually engage uh, on such a uh, relationship. And I also think it's deliberate because it was the first uh, case that the African court is uh, approaching the right to development and the most uh, of its uh, reflections were drawn from African instruments, such as an expert report on the indigenous people's rights from 2005 and also the Ogoni case and mostly the Endorwa case. The reflection to the, the reference to the Yakya Aksa indigenous community case was made by reflection because they only put their name, they, they sit the Moiwana case, but they draw the same specific set of arguments that the African Commission used on the Endorwa case. And most recently it case received a set of uh, references on, during the reparation and then we can see that uh, we have some more material evidence of the citation of the in the careful of the court to make references to both cases from inter-american court i think that's all Thank i you. don't wish to uh, prolong anymore but i'm very grateful for being here thank you very much Thank you, Marcos and Fabio. I ask Henrique to comment as briefly as possible. Okay. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, feel free to, uh, if you have to cut me short. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, so to start, I just want to uh, complain about something. People are calling their own research here humble. Uh, and I do have to say that that's not true, at least for the researchers I've seen here today. And the reason is, Research doesn't have a good research or a good empirical research doesn't have to be with fu uh, full of graphs or full of like programming to be good. Fifty years ago, people didn't have computers in their houses, and they still did good empirical research. So you can still do good empirical research even if you don't show like such a nice graphs as uh, Sean uh, has shown. So there is good empirical research to be done, and there is the need to be every good empirical reason there is a need for it to be done that doesn't involve computing and in fact I, I'll argue and perhaps this will become clear uh, as I keep going on that sometimes we don't it's not that we don't need computer we should not use computers to do some kind uh, some kind of analysis uh, but I'll I, I think I'll, I'll get that. So uh, first, uh, and I think this paper is good to finally address this topic, although we have been talking about this the whole time. There is a million dollar question here, and I guess that everybody has figured that out already. And uh, if you want to get a million dollar or even a billion dollar, I think it's worth it. Uh, we should try answering as a community, as a research community, what influence is. And uh, this is very important. Uh, everybody here has talked, has talked about that. But now I'll give you my take on that. And uh, I was talking to people outside, and I think this example is, is, is good to illustrate this. Uh, during the pandemic, everybody was wearing a mask uh, down the streets. And if you ask someone, hey, why are you wearing a mask? They, I guarantee you, it's very unlikely they will say, oh, I'm wearing a mask because there was a normative by the WHO that says there is a pandemic now and people should wear masks. No, they're wearing masks because either they care about their lives or they have been told by local authorities that they should wear, wear masks. Or they have been told by their friends they should wear masks. It's not because the WHO normative that they are wearing masks. This doesn't mean, however, that the WHO normative wasn't important at all. Actually, it was the beginning, was the story of all of it. So influence cannot and should not be measured by citation. And this is not coming from someone who doesn't use citation 
uh, analysis. This is coming from someone who does use citation analysis. Why? Because it's, for now, we don't know the answer to this question or what it influences. So that's all we can do now. Can we do better? Yeah, perhaps. But we need to sit down as a community and think what influence means. And I'm not telling you that the mathematicians will give you the answer for this. Well, I'm a mathematician. And I'm, I'm, well, I'm not telling that we are giving you the answer for this. Because we don't know if you guys don't tell us what is influence to you. So it's a, it's a dialogue that needs to be done. And uh, it's, I, I guess it's the future uh, or a step that will bring us the future of empirical research in law. Getting to an agreement on what influence or textual influence is. So this is, the first this is the first point. The second point is this paper, uh, and I want to congratulate Marcus and Fabio for the paper, but it has everything to do with influence. The paper is about how can you decide if one court influences the other court. Uh, again, we don't know the, how to measure influence, but suppose we do. Let's suppose we do, and we have a good measurement of influence. We can say, for example, that the inter-American court has deeply influenced the African court of human rights. What can we do with this? Well, my idea, and uh, this is something that, uh, again, this is coming from a mathematician, so if it's too fancy of a language, I'm super sorry. But uh, this is perfectly fit for statistics. Actually, it's perfect fit for something called graphical models. And I know this sounds weird. It's not that weird. Uh, remember that Sean showed something. Uh, Paula just asked me what was that, if I understood that. I, I do. That is a network. A network pretty much shows how to connect stuff. Uh, so for example, if uh, the, the international, um, uh, the inter-American court uh, is really impactful with, uh, in the, into the uh, African court, there will be a, a, an edge, a line, connecting these two points. If uh, the inter-American court has zero impact on the European court, there will be no edge connecting these points. And why are these things important? Because we can do math on these things. And this is where things start getting interesting, because once you start doing math on these things, you can start asking questions. For example, which is the most influential court in the world? Uh, is there a reason for that to be the most influential court in the world? Where did an idea begin? And that's something you guys talk in your paper. And uh, I think there is a, a I, I'm not blaming you for not being able to answer this question. It's a very hard question to answer. But it should be the goal uh, of, I believe uh, what we have been calling today citation analysis to be transformed into an influence analysis is to understand these things with these very complex mathematical models, so these graphical models, these network things. But this requires one thing, and it requires a, it's a statistics. So it requires a very good understanding of what empirical research is. And here I'm talking my view, and I, I'm pretty much sure uh, probably nobody in this table is going to gonna, uh, is gonna agree with me on that, but I have a very narrow definition of empirical research. To me, empirical research requires uh, a set of things. Uh, first, it requires, and this is what I want to focus on, I think the rest, Lucas talked very well today, so no need for me to dwell on that. But the thing that empirical research really needs is a lot of data. Why? Because we can only do statistics with a lot of data. If uh, I ask you guys, for example, uh, th uh, how many of you know constitutional law? I believe that the amount of people who know well constitutional law in this room is much greater than in the rest of the community or in the whole country. And it's not because you're not a representative set. Yes, you're not. But more than that, you're a small number. And doing empirical research with a lot of cases, good, okay, uh, doing empirical research with a lot of cases means that you need a lot of data. So I can say that there is a very good trend, and this is the word trend, of uh, citations coming from one car to the court to the other, because I know out of a lot of uh, examples of not only these citations, but citations that do not come from the court. It could be, and uh, here's my, it's not a criticism, but uh, it's something I want to point out. I know you guys had a, a technical problems on that. I, Almost done. Uh, but uh, uh, I know that case study is what you could do there, but it is not enough to say, for example, that there is a, a strong communication between the two analyzed courts or the three analyzed courts. Uh, it, this has to be done with more uh, cases. So yeah, uh, it's 
let's basically grow bigger, I guess, the number of cases to study, which is hard, I know, but yeah, it's, it's the game. Thank you, uh, Hiki, for your comments. Thank you once again, uh, Marcus and Fabio, for your presentation. Our time short, I'll invite uh, now Ana Laura Feitosa to present the paper The Latin American Constitutionality Block and Conventionality Control uh, near International uh, Inter American Court of Human Rights and STF. Brazilian Supreme Court cross study. Uh, Ana Laura is a researcher and consultant in international law. She holds a Master of Human Rights and Democracy and a Bachelor of the Laws, and is also a member of the NEPERI, the Nucleus of International Law of the UERJ. Please. Thank you so much, Caetano, for the kind introduction. So, I do have a presentation. So, I would just uh, start by saying that it is an honor to me to be for me to be here today so thank you so much for the Gemone Center of Excellence and FGV Rio and well as you can see now the title of my paper is the Latin American Constitutionality Con Block and Conventionality Control a needed Inter-American Court of Human Rights and Supremo Tribunal Federal Cross Study so I'll quote Professor Lucas uh, in, in his metaphor by saying that I actually had a family-sized <laughs> Chicago deep dish pizza in this one because it's actually a small window of my dissertation. So uh, I had two days <laughs> to make it into a single serving because the deadline was approaching. It was a challenge and I'm very sorry if the translation also <laughs> wasn't the best. I mean, uh, it was originally written in Spanish since my master's degree is from the Universidad Nacional de San Martín. And so just for the ones that haven't read it, I <laughs> translated Costa Rica to Costa Delicia, so it wasn't the best one. <laughs> but I, I'm deeply, really sorry about that. And as you can see in the table of contents, I will not start by stating the objectives or the methodology and the justification of the paper, which is a little bit weird, but to be honest, I feel like there is still, even though I've rewritten them and edited them down, there is still, there still feel a, a, a lot more like a dissertation objectives and such rather than a paper. So I will be working on that. I'll be further working on that. That's why I didn't feel comfortable talking about it today. But let's dive into the concepts that are, that are in the paper. So. I will assume that most, if not all of you, are already familiar with the inter-American uh, human rights system, but just to go on the record, it exists within the Organization of American States, and it was firstly brought to light in 1969 with the American Convention on Human Rights, or Pacto de Sonsidad da Costa Rica in Portuguese. And what this convention did was focused mainly on solutions for human rights violations and it brought the possibility of international prosecution to the inter-American reality with the advancement of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and of course the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. The commission is the principal and autonomous organ of the OES and it has mainly and <laughs> very briefly two big functions, the first one being receiving and processing all individual petitions to um, of possible human rights violations and deciding if they'll actually make their way into the court or not, if they'll try to make an agreement with the country or not. And the second one being uh, monitoring and reporting the state of human rights in all member states of the OES. So, and the, Ameri the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, for its part, it is not actually an organ of the OES, but of the convention itself. It's an auton autonomous judicial organ of the convention. And its jurisdiction is divided into two special functions, that is, advisory and contentious. So, the constitutional blocks as, oh, sorry, <laughs> as well as the conventionality control, the concepts, they were 
firstly seen in European law, but when they came to Latin America, I would just like to point that out because you may see people talking about it in a totally different way that I'll talk about them today. Because when they came to Latin America, they were completely changed. It is not the same thing talking about constitutional block or conventionality control here in Brazil, in Latin America, as it is in Africa or in Europe. So the reality of the region was a main point that, that completely muted those, those concepts here. So in general, the doctrine of the block of constitutionality is composed of opening clauses to international human rights law present in national constitutions, which allow non-constitutional norms, the HR treaties, to obtain recognition of constitutional hierarchies. So these are norms interpret, interpret, sorry, systematic, systematically with the nation's constitutions. So the blocks of constitutionality, and I say this in plural because each country has its own, uh, are in summary the possibility of reviewing laws and internal norms with the international law of human rights, elevating international treaties concerning HRs to a constitutional status, that is, transforms them into an obstacle for the validation of internal legis legislation. And this incorporation has different levels depending on how, how each clause, each opening clause, were written in a state's constitution. And also, just to briefly highlight it, the opening clauses are the very fundament of this concept, and they're commonly referred to as clausulas de materialidad abierta or clausulas de apertura in uh, Latin American doctrine. So that all sums up to the fact that the Constitution is no longer the only supreme norm, but shares space at the top of the pyramid with other provisions. So we can visually see here that that's the old normal uh, calcium pyramid classic one. And right by its side would be the theory of the legal trapezoid that is utilized by Professor Flavio, Flavio Piovesan to illustrate the flattening of this pyramid uh, and the rethinking of interactions between different legal orders. The constitutional basis for this is precisely the opening clauses, but they are different between the countries and the respective doctrine of the region. Due, due to these differences, there are innumerable, innumerable <laughs> political obstacles to constitutional blocks. Even national courts, national constitutional courts, began giving interpretations of uh, human rights treaties opposed from the ones uh, that the Inter-American Court holds. So in this sense, the conventionality control in the Inter-American human rights systems emerged as a powerful tool that binds the states to the interpretations of the court. Shortly, <laughs> Uh, conventionality control can be described as an important, as an important political reinforcement of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights since it brought accountability of the member states to the due application of their blocks of cons constitutionality in accordance with the interpretation of the Inter-American Court. Specifically, since the decision of Amonasi Arellano y otros vestores Chile in 2006, the conventionality control has emerged as a mechanism of, of great interest for the construction of an inter-American use comune in matters of human and constitutional rights. This concept, therefore, is of the utmost importance in the inter-American human rights system since it constitutes a duty of the judicial powers that cannot be subtracted by under any pretext. Shortly, its underutilization not only constitutes a violation of human rights, but also of the jurisdiction of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights itself, since it was a way for the court to assert its jurisdictions that was accepted by the signatory states of the ECHR. So uh, it comes hand in hand with the constitutionality, constitutionality blocks, and of course, each state already has its own constitutional control. That leads to the prat practical aspect of it. The double control uh, is the exercise of both conventional and constitutional controls 
that was conceptualized by the court also in 2006 in the case Baguado Afari y Otros versus Peru, also known as Trabajadores Cesados del Congreso. <laughs> and the courts stated that the organs of the judiciary must, must exercise not only constitutionality control, but also conventionality between the internal norms and the American Convention. Uh, you may be thinking, okay, maybe this girl has a, a screw loose in her mind because where does the sovereignty of the state get to be in the middle of it? Uh, where's the non-intervention principle gets to be in the middle of it? That seems a little bit like too much. So uh, essentially, with the adoption of the block of constitutionality, the concept of sovereignty itself and the state adjusts to contemporary times, linking up with new ways of articulating politics. Specifically, the open clauses, the open constitutional clauses express precisely the will of the state itself to integrate international human rights law into the national legal order. And so these mechanisms aren't like a suppression of sovereignty, but a result, the very result of its exercise. Okay, so how <laughs> does it work in Brazil? Or does it work in Brazil is the question in play here. I believe that if you, if you manage to understand the concepts you already know, that Brazil has an opening clause in the second paragraph of the fifth article, but that everything, <laughs> everything in law is very debatable. And since the, cons cons the original constitu constituents went for a broader version of an opening clause that doesn't explicitly say look here, the th these treaties will be like amendments. It, it didn't say that. So it was a, a very ongoing discussion until 2004 with the refor reform of the Judiciary Amendment that added the third paragraph to that article in which uh, there is a very specific process for international human rights treaties to be considered constitutional amendments but there are a number of human rights treaties signed bef uh, before that and what happened to them. The first theory that was mainly discussed when the amendment came into play was that the all previous HR treaties would formally convert to the constitutional level or the second one would be that only those submitted to the described protocol would have constitutional status. And all these are very current discussions, so don't take my word as final whatsoever. But the Supreme F uh, Federal Court decided to go with the more restrictive view by saying that it was an obligation, that the treaties had to go through the process to be considered uh, constitutional amendments. And wha what does that actually mean for us? It means that the American Convention on Human Rights is not constitution, constitutional in Brazil. It is only super legal. So what did the court do with the opening clause besides that? Uh, the methodology of my empirical research is actually very similar to the one Julia presented. I utilized keywords. In t uh, I, I searched for keywords into the Supreme Court's uh, base itself. And the research was carried out using the jurisprudence search tool. And what it did was create four categories. The first one being the expression appears as a qualifying criteria in the site's research tool, too, but it's not mentioned throughout the ruling, so only as a keyword. The term was mentioned by one or more ministers without the concept being developed, so mentioned, and the concept was developed by one or more ministers, but it was not the basis of the decision, so explained. And finally, actually utilized, the concept was developed by one or more ministers and was the basis of the decision. So, it's useful to point out that besides the 
shockingly low number of cases, um, the three judgments that were effectively based on the constitutional block dealt with issues that were highly evident in the ACHR itself. The arrest of the unfaithful depository and the two other decisions were about pr the prison imposed by a second inst instance court. Thus, it can be said that the STF only uses the, nationals, the nation's constitutional block when the concept is absolutely necessary for the deliberation of the issue, since it would not be possible to build a cohesive understanding of such themes without mentioning the H A A C H R and explaining its position in the national legal system. Consequently, we must also look at the Supreme Court's use of the term conventionality control. We can observe once again the scarce mention of international human rights law by the Brazilian Federal Supreme Court and how it is extremely difficult to find repercussions on the STF on international human rights deci decisions issued by bodies over which Brazil recognizes jurisdiction. The deficiency of the practice of inter-American law in the STF is clear. The only one where the control was actually used was a case that dealt with the, the recognition of a double criminal prosecution. So, for a total of four rulings, four cases over the span of 17 years, and that's being very kind because the constitutional block actually dates before that. And that is the same court that judged 3,590 cases last year only. So four is an insignificant amount. Therefore, we must insist on a dialogue between the Inter-American Court and the STF since both must fulfill the same mission of guaranteeing respect for the fundamental rights and human dignity. The current dysfunctionality of the Latin American bloc of constitutionality and the control of con conventionality in Brazil due to the position of the Supreme Court represents a huge obstacle to the full effectiveness of the ACHR and the guarantee and effectiveness of human rights throughout the nation. In summary, the application of the Latin American bloc of constitutionality and conventionality control are extremely limited even at the highest constitutional level in Brazil today. It is necessary to reconcile the jurisprudence of the STF with the Inter-American Court of Human Rights because the constitutional consecration of international instruments and jurisprudence would effectively straighten the protection of human rights at the national level to the extent that they would become binding to for political agents based on the Constitution. So I'll wrap it up because I know we are in a time span. I'd like to finish up by saying that the hum human rights education and its consequent implementation are the key factors in the transformation of the current lack of Brazilian logic when dealing with the subject. So indeed, education and human rights is a key factor of transformation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for your presentation and for uh, sticking to, the to our time. Uh, Rafael, would you please briefly comment? Yeah, briefly. <laughs> Thank you. It was a very nice presentation. I liked it a lot. Um, I can give a few comments because I'm not from law. I'm, I'm, I'm doing math. I can give a few comments about the um, data analysis you, you propose. Um, so this last slide, what was the formulation you gave? Uh, like the constitutional block is not implemented in Brazil, something like that? Yes, yes. Um, <laughs> but do you really think you can deduce that mm -hmm. from this analysis of the few cases of the STF? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't that I didn't want to analyze more. It was more so that there wasn't anything else to analyze. Mm. So all of the cases were the cases that, are, that I presented to you. So there aren't any more. Okay. 
But I think it's the same question we all debated today about influence and, and uh, so let me give you some ideas of how you can m measure influence if it's not be directly cited mm -hmm. uh, because you have uh, indirect influence when the minister he knows but he don't want to cite you have type 2 indirect when he doesn't even know where the ID come from um, you um, I mean, would be great to analyze maybe. <laughs> it's a complicated question. Uh, you should compare cases where um, when the uh, I don't know. Um, uh, other question. Um, you only use the decision is collegia dash. Oh, no, I uh, I utilize the, I, I totally forgot the, the word for it, but the ones that are oh, there's only one side, yes. <laughs> monocratic. It's monocratic when it's, no, it it yeah. when it's uh, single uh, justice ruling and collegiate for the... the uh yeah, I, I did search both of those. You sure? Because I searched this yesterday, I found 300 monocratic decisions of about these terms so i would have to <laughs> assess that well, again the i i did this research last year okay but yeah i'll i'll look into it but no, i if you found 20 28 documents <laughs> for the first search the and 37 th uh, and 12 i've seen is the accordion uh, there is the mm. collegial decisions yeah. Well, okay, maybe I'll... No, I'll check it. I'll check it. Thank yeah. you. But well, no, what I want to say is I, I, I love the, the ideas uh, and what you want to say. But yeah, I think it's a, it's a bit weak, the, the justification of it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it goes inside this whole question of how can we actually f try to estimate what people think, thought when they said wha what they said, sure. you know. Uh, maybe it deserves a bit more, uh, uh, you know, uh, not be so sure of what you're yeah, concluding you, in the... Yeah, you can't really be certain of anything in law, I feel like that. And it, it was also brought up when I defended my dissertation as well. So it's Maybe something it's a style I have in so mind. Yeah. yeah, it's definitely something I have in mind, but it's, it's very, indeed, very difficult to answer that. Okay. Thank you, Rafael. Zaluis, uh, would you like to do uh. some final remarks? Yes, uh, just uh, I think it, it's a good follow-up, and uh, I know uh, okay, you said you had a uh, quite a short time to prepare the the paper version, but uh, one important point is being transparent. So, uh, especially when we're dealing with empirical research, uh, and I think one problem might be you did not inform the exact terms you used to search. So, and this ha can have a big influence on the results. So, uh, if you query without uh, quotation marks, uh, like constitutional block, for example, uh, it will give all decisions that have both words regardless of the following each other. Mm -hmm. um, if you want the exact expression, constitutional block, you need quotation marks between it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, this will have a, a, I mean, I would Yes, it depends on the exact search, but this can have a, a huge influence on the results. So uh, I think when we're dealing with empirical research and how we gather data, we have to be very explicit uh, regarding and worrying about reproduce, reproduce I'm sorry, uh, reproduction. So we need to know exactly how you conduct your analysis or your data gathering to be able to do that. And I think with uh, with some tuning and, and being transparent on how you gather each data and maybe adding a, a few plus to use your presentation, uh, it can be the, the whole paper can be a coherent and well-rounded argument in favor of, uh, as part of something bigger, if, I mean, as it might be, have been used in your thesis. Uh, so it's just this short term, and I think it, it's good to uh, remark the importance of being transparent and informing uh, how you gathered and each step was conducted in empirical research. Thank you, José Luis. Thank you once again, Anna, for your presentation. We are right to the end of our second panel. I'd like to thank you, Paulo, once again for the invitation to chair this panel. I'd like to uh, thank the participants and the audience and to congratulate the participants who submitted papers. It's always important in our academic pathway to 
show our research and to receive feedback. And I also thank and congratulate our commentators for the insights. I'm sure I'm going to ask many things for you later on. Um, so thank you once again. We move now to our closing session with Professor Malcolm Langford from the University of Oslo, who is delivering a speech on the mixed methods turn in studying courts. I'll briefly introduce our speaker, Professor Malcolm Langford, as Professor of Public Law at the University of Oslo and Director of the Center of Experimental Legal Learning. Uh, he's also a Jenkins Professor of the University of Bergen and as a lawyer and social scientist has several publications on human rights, international investment and development, comparative constitutionalism, law and technology. Professor Malcolm Blankford, thank you for uh, your participation and the floor is yours. I'm not hearing you. Maybe you should unmute yourself first. Sorry. <laughs> Typical professor mistake. Thanks okay. very much for the, uh, the invita <laughs> invitation to uh, present. And I'm, apologies that I'm coming at the end of a very long day uh, for you uh, in Brazil. Uh, I'm actually in Australia where it's uh, yeah, 7 30 uh, in the morning uh, on Friday. So. I'm going to conclude this uh, conference with a focus on different types of methods. And the first question we might ask is why, why use mixed methods? And the simple answer is the old hammer and nail uh, problem. That we are trained in specific disciplines with specific methods and we tend to use uh, the theories and methods from that tradition in answering any question that comes across our path. So whether it's a screw, a nail, uh, an ant, uh, a tiger, we turn to our disciplinary hammer uh, to bang away at it. And sometimes this might work, but many times uh, it may not. But delving a little bit more into the, the literature, uh, Ran Herschel, one of the leading scholars in compared to constitutional law, notes the problems of monomethodism in highly interdisciplinary fields. One of the perplexing oddities of contemporary constitutional studies, he says, continues to be the disciplinary divide and consequent lack of communication between legal scholarship on constitutional law, arguably the most overtly political branch of law, public or private, and social science scholarship on constitutional history, development and politics. One could arguably Oh, sorry. No. One could arguably uh, put international law into this uh, and perhaps even more uh, political uh, area of law and make the same argument. Um, a second reason is the comparative strengths of different uh, uh, methods. Uh, if we look at the issue of causation, uh, for example, uh, and compare quantitative methods on one hand, and qualitative methods, uh, uh, on the other hand, including, I would say, uh, doctrinal uh, methods, um, we get these different uh, strengths. Um, so quantitative methods are very good at a systematic approach to measuring uh, something, uh, being able to generalize at, at a very high level, um, identify systematic patterns, uh, so forth, because of its pow the power of correlation. Uh, in, in quantitative methods, whereas qualitative methods give us a lot more context. We're able to get uh, nuance, we're able to capture perhaps more socially complex phenomena that can't be captured in mere numbers. We are also able to often identify multiple causal paths, uh, a challenge with quantitative methods, and, ex and explain individual and non-conformist cases. Secondly, the logics in these different methods are quite different. Quantitative methods very much works on a probabilistic uh, approach. There is a probability that, uh, someone mentioned face mask earlier, <laughs> that if you wear a face mask, uh, the chances are uh, that, uh, of someone catching uh, COVID-19 uh, will be 30% less, uh, for example. Whereas qualitative and, and legal logics work on, often on a different basis uh, when it comes to, say, causation, it's necessary in sufficient conditions. If these things are in place, um, 
then there is a likelihood that something would happen, but there also need to be some sufficient conditions uh, to actually secure uh, that causal uh, path. A very way, a different way of thinking about causation, um, and both have their, uh, in my view, uh, place. And finally, the issue of validity, say, within different quantitative, qualitative and doctrinal uh, methods. So we may have internal validity. We may be able to show, for example, causation in a lab experiment. Um, so I've done, for example, work on the effects of international courts on public opinion using lab experiments, uh, asking people what they think on different cases and then giving some groups different treatments, for example, extra information that may influence their opinion on a public issue because a court has said something on it. And able to show, for example, like other studies around, there's a 20% shift often in public opinion once people hear about court decisions. But then you have problems of external validity. Does it work in the real world? And it often, it, it often it doesn't, or it struggles to. And other methods may be much better at capturing what is happening in the real world. That may be uh, quantitative methods using survey data or qualitative methods using interview, different from more lab-based methods. The same very much applies to, to legal methods. If you, uh, you can have legal methods on the book, uh, books which have high internal validity or legal methods in action, <laughs> uh, actually taking account of how actors are behaving, which have much higher external uh, validity. Um, uh, and uh, just to give you an example from the ICJ, the ICJ has a you know, wonderful doctrine on how we establish international customary law. Uh, but does it ever use it? Uh, it, it? It never seems to apply its own doctrine in practice. Uh, it tends to often do something rather different when it finds international customary law. One of the other reasons for studying mixed methods or using mixed methods is the needless paradigm wars that we continue to see uh, uh, in, in, in law um, very strongly entrenched arguments over the virtues of one method uh, over the other. Uh, here's a you know, quote from uh, Bruce Ackerman saying, look, there's no way we can use quantitative methods uh, in, in studying uh, differences and changes in, in, in constitutions uh, over time. Um, and you can see at the, at the end here, and this echoes one of the early commentators' uh, comments to some extent, the number of success stories is much too small for statistical analysis, the number of variables much too large, there is no way out but an appeal to old-fashioned insight. So sceptical to the use of quantitative methods. And we see that also in international law. Um, for example, uh, Calais in 2006, I'm not convinced by the hypothesis and doubt that there can be constructed a vi viable relationship in terms of research showing judicial bias on the ICJ. And there's a famous paper by uh, Posner and de Figueiredo who found that permanent judges on the International Court of Justice are more likely to vote for a disputing state that shares a similar level of democracy and economic development as their own and to a lesser extent with shared religion and language. So if you're a German judge, uh, you're more likely to side with a state like Australia. If you're a judge from Burkina Faso, you're more likely to side with a, a state uh, like uh, Malawi or India. Um, so, but the, you know, the numbers seem to indicate a very clear relationship, but there was deep scepticism from, from this legal scholar, scholar that one could study in such a way. And the paradigm wars roll on. If you look at the recent uh, International Journal of Constitutional Law uh, re review essay on a, a new book on whether constitution, uh, constitutional rights matter using mostly quantitative analysis, uh, the subtitle is, you know, the cool kid on the block are all smoke or, or, or mirrors. The important thing to remember is if we step outside of law is that mixed methods um, have a very long uh, 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 history. Um, and um, let me just see if I've got it there. Here we go. Um, and so this is why we'll move on to now the second question, what are um, mixed methods? Because there were two revolutions essentially uh, in, in the social sciences. The first happened in discrete um, uh, social sciences. Um, uh, for example, the first mixed method article is said to be in psychology um, uh, in, in terms of using different um, uh, methods to, to find uh, personality traits. 
This was then uh, followed in a, in a parallel development with it across social sciences in the capital M mixed methods movement with journals and conferences uh, and, and so forth. Because there's a fragmented field and a very fixed uh, field, one tends to get very different, different definitions on what are mixed methods. Uh, but we can come with at least, this is my definition of what mixed <coughs> methods are. So if we take a strict approach to the mixing, um, but there must be mixing of different methods at some point uh, in the process. This would uh, exclude contextual departure points where you, for example, discuss some statistics before you go on to do your legal analysis or qualitative analysis. It would discuss mere programmatic approaches, uh, for example, a, a big research agenda like one has uh, at FJV or um, an edited book where one has lots of different methods going on, but one never brings them together and puts them in conversation uh, with each other. There must be at some point the mixing, and I think we, one can be strict about that. But I think one can be very flexible as to which methods are mixed. Um, the methods can be outside social sciences. They can be from the humanities, uh, more interpretative, uh, hermeneutic uh, methods, uh, doctrinal methods uh, from law, for example, from the natural sciences, uh, for example. We've been seeing increasing use of uh, geographic infoscience uh, in human rights uh, scholarship. This is contrary to the earlier capital M mixed methods movement, which required the mixing of specific quantitative and qualitative uh, methods. Uh, but we've now moved on from that. And I'll come to some examples where uh, scholars have mixed, for example, doctrinal and, and quantitative uh, uh, methods. And the last presentation had, had, uh, had elements of that also. Um, also, uh, I am agnostic, like increasingly others, as to where they mix, whether you're mixing methods at the data gathering stage or at the analytical stage. Um, and this approach to being agnostic on methods really corresponds to you know, Aristotle's three forms of, knowledge, uh, of knowing. Uh, on the right-hand side, we have observation, which is very much the, the domain of empirical methods, whether it's quantitative methods or qualitative uh, methods. Then we have revelation in the middle, which lawyers are very fond of. Most of our legal training is in revelatory methods, where we basically you know, like Moses getting the Ten Commandments uh, on the mountain, we go to the, to the parliament um, or to the court and we get our commandments and, and then we interpret them uh, 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 for everybody. And then we have the, the third, which is reason, uh, logical deduction, which is obviously strong in philosophy and legal theory, but it's also present in most other disciplines in some way. Uh, and so this, I think, therefore, Small's definition uh, in the annual review um, is quite nice. So the, the two elements here are defined as mixed data collection, so mixing at the data collection or information gathering stage, studies uh, those based on at least two kinds of data, such as field notes and administrative records, or two means of collecting them, such as interviewed, interviewing and controlled experimentation. And as we'll come to, computational methods are increasingly being used to gather data uh, a lot of data uh, for then, you know, quantitative, qualitative or doctrinal research at the analytical stage. And then mixed data analysis studies those that regardless of the number of data sources either employ more than one analytical technique or cross technique and types of data, such as using regression analysis to analyze uh, interview uh, transcripts. So data gathering or analytical stage uh, it can have, happen, or you have one type of method at the data stage and one type of method at the analytical stage. And uh, here's an example where uh, in, a, in, in a new chapter we've analysed the impact of the first uh, LGBT decision at the international level, the case of Tuna versus Australia in 1994, where the Human Rights Committee established that the criminalisation of same-sex relations in Tasmania was a violation of the right to privacy. A groundbreaking decision, which was you know recently, uh, 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 its anniversary was recently fated and, and explored. Um, we use all sorts of different methods. We use qualitative methods of process tracing to trace the impact of this decision on uh, same-sex relations in Australia, both in the legal domain and material policy domain and the public domain of public opinion. Um, 
We also, though, once we found that there were very strong impacts in Australia, we compared it to 20 other nine decisions against Australia to see if there was something specific about uh, uh, Toonan. Were the findings in this one case replicable when we looked at other 29 other cases? When we looked at, for example, why, did, why was the Toonan case so successful in having impact? Do those factors uh, uh, count? Can we expect the same in other cases? And we, ha we found varying results. We then also used uh, large M methods, you know, massive sample, to look at the international level to see whether this case influenced the way states reported to the Human Rights Committee. And we did see an uptick in, 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 the, in the inclusion of LGBT issues in state reports, but it was mostly from uh, Western states uh, and some states in Latin America who had already begun to decriminalise. So we actually found it had less impact uh, at the international level. So third question is, when do we need MEX methods? Um, I'm, uh, I'm not an evangelist uh, for, for, for using lots of different types of methods. If I'm an evangelist for anything, it's that we use the methods that are appropriate to our question. Uh, and you know, if we're going to have a, a question that would indicate that a different method uh, should be appropriate, then we should try and see if we can use that method. Otherwise, we perhaps need to change our question. Otherwise, we run into the hammer and nail problem. So, when it comes to types of research questions, if the, right, if the research question is rather closed in a, in a sort of methodological way, then obviously we don't need method, uh, methods. So, if we, if we ask, is there a right to same-sex marriage under the European Convention of Human Rights? Well, the way we phrase that, and we're using the word is, seems to indicate clearly it's a doctrinal uh, uh, question and most likely legal methods, traditional legal methods will suffice. Uh, however, um, if we're asking a, 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 a question um, uh, as to whether an asylum seeker um, uh, is able to gain asylum under uh, uh, constitutional migration law in a particular uh, uh, country, uh, or whether a claimant might be able to uh, secure the right to same-sex marriage from the European Court of Human Rights, suddenly the openness of that question means we have to go beyond legal methods because we're no longer talking about what the, the legal materials before the courts. We're also talking about their potential behaviour uh, uh, and so into, que into questions of judicial behaviour, and that raises you know, the need to use quantitative and qualitative and computational methods, uh, in my view. So the more open the, the research question is, uh, the more we're going to probably need to use mixed methods. More specifically, um, mixed methods have a particular value when we have two types of uh, challenges in our research of an evidential nature, often. Um, the first is confirmation. Uh, and the second is compensation. So with the confirmatory approach, we may be fairly confident that our method can answer the question, but we want to be robust, we want to be sure, and so we use another method to check. Okay? So we may be confident that, in fact, International Court of Justice judges you know, are biased uh, on the basis of their own state's development, uh, and to, to, uh, type of democratic governance and language and religion, but we want to kind of check whether that's true, so we go off and we do some qualitative work. We might interview, for example, judges. We might interview uh, research associates or lawyers who've worked with those judges. We might go off and we might do some discursive analysis of their academic text to see, do we see those sorts of uh, linguistic biases uh, or biases emerge through their linguistic uh, choices? There's a whole field of political psychology uh, which does this. The other approach is compensation, where we know we've got a problem uh, with our method, our indicators are not so strong, or we know that doing the qualitative work <laughs> with only a limited number of interviews, we can't really generalise at this at level. We need to compensate for the weaknesses of one method by turning to the strengths uh, of another. So how do we use mixed methods? Do we is it just like you know making a, a soup quickly at home and we throw in some vegetables and we throw in some some meat and we throw in a bit of garlic uh, you know and maybe we're in a bit of an Asian mood so we throw some ginger in as well you know how do we actually actually mix? So 
What we've seen, uh, in, in particularly the capital lemmings methods revolution over the last 25 years, is some system king to how we do, do that mixing. Uh, and then I've developed that framework a little further in, in terms of putting in data science and computational methods and small and others have also done uh, similar work in that respect. So we can think about essentially about three different types of um, uh, mixed methods work in terms of research design. That's the, that's the space we are now. A sequential approach, concurrent approach, and a crossover approach. So sequential, one first, followed by another. Concurrent, both at the same time. Uh, uh, crossover, uh, where we're, we're hopping between uh, different methods uh, with, within data collection or analysis or, or, or both. And, and it's where computational methods particularly feature. And within each of these, we have different uh, 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 approaches, um, uh, which we're going to uh, explore. So if you look at the sequential approach, you can have an explanatory approach where you begin in a quantitative fashion, got some hypotheses, you, uh, you uh, collect some indicators, you run a regression analysis, you find some uh, relationships, and then you go off and do some qualitative uh, uh, work. Or you begin an exploratory manner, um, you know, perhaps doing some interviews and developing some, you know, finding some theories as you go, as you interview people or you work through some uh, legal material and you go off and uh, gain, collect some data to test uh, how generalizable your findings are. And then you have an eclectic approaches where you might be moving between them in different ways. So just quickly some exa good examples of both. A great example of an explanatory approach is Beth Simmons mobilizing uh, uh, for human rights, uh, where she analyzes the impact of international human rights uh, uh, treaties. Uh, and with some new um, statistical methods does find some positive relationships for some international treaties, but then goes off and does qualitative work to test the type of hypotheses and theories that she found to be working quantitatively. The idea that basically what international human rights treaties uh, do is shift domestic uh, politics, give actors new arguments, whether they're uh, social movements, judges, opposition politicians, uh, new levers and discourses that they can can use. And she finds you know coherence uh, between her quality of findings and her uh, regression results. Um, and I should add the book won the American Society of International Law Prize, uh, and, it's, and it's a great example um, of an explanatory approach. Then you have an exploratory approach, um, Varun Garai and Daniel Brinks investigating five jurisdictions on the impact of economic and social rights judgments of courts. Um, and from that deep uh, qualitative and doctrinal work, they build up slowly data sets from which they then do more statistical analysis. Um, and so, uh, including on Brazil. Um, uh, and then you have an eclectic approach, and there's a really nice example from the Leiden Journal of International Law, dealing with international courts, the, the subject of your conference, um, which deals with, with uh, uh, a theory that's been uh, you know, developed by Benny over the last 10 years on the margin of appreciation, one of the classic doctrines of the European Court of Human Rights. And the idea is that um, as the court has encountered backlash and, and, and is dealing with more difficult cases, uh, it's turned to the margin of appreciation um, uh, in, a, in a deferential manner to avoid ruling on such cases, saying that it's not a, it's not a sufficient state consensus, for example, for us to find that there is a right to abortion on demand under the European Convention of, of Human Rights. Um, this author um, then comes along and says, mm, I'm not so sure. Um, perhaps something different is, is, is going on. So what she first does is find where margin of appreciation is mentioned in all the cases. Um, and, and she finds, for example, that it emerges much earlier than, say, for example, my good colleague Mikhail Madsen uh, analyzes when looking at the question of, of, of backlash, uh, that it comes much earlier. And then she does doctrinal research on when the courts are actually using this term. And she, she argues that they, they use it basically as a descriptor um, for hard cases, for difficult cases. And it doesn't actually seem to affect the results of those cases. So 
instead of a, her alternative theory based on this mixing of, a, of, of quantitative methods and doctrinal methods is to say it's not about deference. It's just a label that courts are using. You need to go deeper into the individual judgments to understand why a state won, uh, rather than just looking at the surface level use of the expression margin of appreciation. So I commend uh, that article to you. I've also done some um, sequential work um, on, on, on mixed methods on the impact of, for example, the group on the most famous socioeconomic rights decision, um, the group on decision in, in South Africa, which was lauded for its you know, great reasoning, but everybody said the, the applicants, including Mrs. Kupong, never got a house. And um, scholars around the world have cited a, an article saying, you know, Mrs. Kupong died in 2008 uh, without a house. Um, but what I did is actually visited the community, and uh, actually uh, three times, and found that the actually house the house was built, uh, and houses were built for the community. Uh, and there's even a community centre um, named after her. And my analysis showed by using process tracing, qualitative methods, following uh, budgetary statistics and policy development, there were significant range of impacts uh, that have been uh, 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 missed. So basically getting into the empirical material and also being willing to visit um, uh, had a real difference uh, in, in, in understanding the impact of this iconic case. But I didn't stop there. Like with the Tunin case, I compared it to others. I was, wanted to make sure that it wasn't just one case where we said, great, there was lots of impact, courts are wonderful. Um, I compared it to seven other cases which had started in the same circumstances where an informal settlement was uh, threatened by eviction and went to court. And I found, like most impact researchers, great variation. Some cases have greater input, impact than Groupon, others had uh, little or zero uh, impact. So moving uh, quickly on to concurrent approaches, um, that's where you collect data at the same time. Um, it might be in two different spaces, that's triangulation or nested in the same uh, empirical instrument, say survey, you collect diff two different types of data. Um, so, uh, for example, there's an you know, article on asylum seekers uh, to Australia, where uh, on one hand they did focus groups um, with uh, some of the uh, different actors involved, and then they did a survey with asylum seekers and put that data together. Or in, 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 in tracing for the International Criminal Court, um, claims of ethnic cleansing in Uganda, um, researchers combined uh, geographic uh, information uh, systems and science to analyse where there have been significant changes viewed from the sky <laughs> uh, in, in terms of the presence of villages over time, to identify where villages might have been destroyed, where ethnic cleansing might have occurred. And then they followed that up with on-the-ground fieldwork to test out uh, those geographic observations uh, uh, from above uh, and then interviewed the relevant uh, villagers uh, who, who may have survived uh, ethnic cleansing. And then you have nested, approach, nested approaches. And one of my favourite uh, articles here is by Katherine Lindnos on the impact of this, the US Supreme Court on public opinion. Um, where she, uh, in a single survey, um, both asked uh, Americans what they thought about a policy issue uh, after there had been Supreme Court judgments, for example, on Obamacare, the Health Care Act under President Obama, and a, a new migration decision by the, the Supreme Court. Um, but then in, in follow-up questions with some of those respondents in the survey, she used experimental treatments where they got extra information in order to test further hypotheses. For example, if you learn that there is a dissenting judge on a decision, does that change whether you change your opinion or not uh, on an issue? Uh, and, it, and, and, it, and it turns out that it has a significant effect. So finding out that Justice Scalia <laughs> dissented um, meant that you were pretty much, if you were a more Republican-leaning uh, voter, were almost likely to not change your opinion on that particular issue. Finally, crossover approaches, uh, um, where we um, we move in different ways. For example, 
we use computation analysis of the text or, or, or legal data. We have topic modeling, case prediction, network analysis. Some of these things have been mentioned, I think, today, and I'll briefly mention them. Um, but then we have different sort of quantitative and qualitative crossover approaches. Um, for example, we might have a whole lot of uh, interviews that, that we, we've done and a whole lot of uh, transcripts, and then we do computational text analysis on that, uh, those transcripts, or we use quantitative, even a regression analysis uh, on, on those uh, transcripts, something which is increasingly being done. Um, and obviously the rise of data science methods is greatly helping us, so here's a, a few quick examples. We have around 10, 12 papers now predicting outcomes in the European Court of Human uh, Rights, rights, basically using uh, the, the, just the text and the facts of decisions uh, to, uh, to create uh, algorithms that predict the likelihood of a violation or not. Uh, and then some scholars have even set up a website which predicts the decisions coming out a week later from the court based on the press release of the, from the court uh, describing briefly uh, the facts. <coughs> with around sort of 75% success rates in predicting outcomes. Um, okay. uh, we've also done a lot of computational work uh, in international, international economic law. So with Cosette Kramer, for example, she um, was asking whether backlash uh, by um, WTO members against the dispute settlement body uh, led to more deferential uh, decisions. Uh, by those dispute settlement uh, bodies. And she measures that backlash uh, using uh, um, uh, quantitative text analysis to measure the mood <laughs> uh, of, of, of different states at different times. And then, then you use quantitative analysis in the analytical phase to see the effects of those mood changes among states on uh, uh, in, on the outcomes and find particularly the, mood, the moods of the US and the European Union are quite instrumental in influence, appearing to influence uh, the decisions of the dispute settlement body. So I think we've been a lot of discussion on influence. Uh, this is uh, one, one, one example of actually measuring the influence, in this case of states, on judicial behaviour. Um, we've also done network analysis of international uh, investment arbitrators in the council. We had 4,000 arbitrators and legal counsel and secretariats. Uh, with over 77,000 relationships between them to map who are the most powerful actors in international investment and arbitration, but also analysing double hatting, where arbitrators are acting simultaneously as counsel in different cases, uh, which raises issues of conflicts, conflicts of interest. Uh, and there we could only use computational uh, methods. Another computational method we've used is to predict authorship in international arbitration. Um, did the arbitrator really write the decision? Um, with how influential were the wings? Uh, and how potentially influential was the uh, secretariat? Uh, uh, and this goes to different theories in judicial um, uh, uh, behaviour. But we are able to find uh, that some arbitrators seem to, to actually uh, write their decision based on their previous academic and legal work, where others we found great variation um, when we came to predicting who actually wrote the decision. So I'm just going to sum up now and with a final uh, comment on what are the limitations of mixed methods analysis. And there are some. Um, so when you try to put them together, you have this problem of commensurability <laughs> of apples and oranges. And you've seen I've been using the, um, the image of, of, of an orange and an apple, but can you actually do that? Uh, and there's an ontological problem that, for example, in quantitative methods, there's a hierarchy of approaches. And the, the, the experimental uh, uh, approach with high levels of specification is viewed as the best uh, approach. If you go to qualitative methods, probably process tracing is viewed as the, the gold standard of, of, of methods. And so you have this uh, starting problem. And then you have epistemological uh, problems. Those using quantitative methods tend to view the world in objective terms as something that can be measured uh, with distance uh, by a researcher. The more and more you become qualitative, and particularly at the interpretivist end of qualitative methods uh, in some parts of sociology, particularly anthropology, uh, many uh, also criminology, 
You Malcolm, tend to view uh, the I'm sorry to interrupt you, if yeah. you can hear. Just, yeah. just uh, c may I ask you to wrap up, because we are almost yeah. at the end of the, uh, of the yeah. closing session. No please. Worries. So very briefly, these methods are very difficult, though, to, to, to pull together. Um, you can try and triangulate them, make them commensurable. There are some examples of that, in fact, looking at the impact of constitutional uh, law. Uh, other alternatives are just to give up, uh, saying it can't be done, to be pragmatic in a, a Rortian way and say, well, in the post-positivist way, we try and put these things in conversation together, or a bricolage approach, we just present it and, and you can interpret it as the reader. Uh, but there's also practical challenges. Um, if you're trained just as a lawyer, can you learn new tricks in quantitative and quality methods? If you're a social scientist, can you really learn uh, legal methods? Uh, it's challenging. One often has imposter syndrome. <laughs> uh, my own experience going into new methods is particularly experimental and computational is to go through the, the rite of, uh, of uh, ritual self-humiliation uh, as, as one learns and is embarrassed and then slowly, slowly improves. But one can start small uh, using uh, mere description and, and simple approaches and, and build up. One can also partner up uh, and, and work with colleagues from other uh, disciplines and methodological traditions. So in conclusion, uh, mixed methods uh, is essentially two things. On one hand, it's like a lolly shop or a candy shop. There's lots of different methods um, uh, we can use um, uh, to answer our research questions. However, you know that when you eat too much candy or lollies, it can make you <laughs> Feel a bit sick. That can sometimes it can be difficult uh, to to do too much of it, uh, and sometimes you need to pick your poison as to when you use mixed methods and to which extent. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Malcolm. So we are. This is the, this is our closing session. It's the end of this uh, of this of the panel two devoted to working with uh, large databases on international courts and tribunals. And we couldn't finish better than having with the, with this excellent presentation of Malcolm from Malcolm Langford. His has a background in political science and also in law. And I think he's the best person to discuss uh, the use of mixed methods and the mixed methods turn in the study of international courts. Um, this is uh, this is a challenge for us, Malcolm. I don't know if you have been following, if you followed all the uh, discussions that we had. Um, we admitted that we are, you know, in, in the in the beginning of this process of learning how to apply different methods in doing. In, 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 in doing research regarding international courts. Um, some of us here uh, apply uh, a pro uh, program uh, natural language processing for this and other ones uh, are engaged in this, in this direction. So we are really uh, in this process of, of learning how to do it um, and I think it was very interesting y what you said uh, in terms of definition, in terms of types, uh, in terms of uh, mixed data collection analysis, uh, whenever you need uh, mixed uh, methods. So uh, what are, how can we, uh, what are the possibilities for us in terms of, of choice and, uh, and how do we use them? And, uh, and then you bring examples, uh, concrete examples of papers addressing uh, sequential concurrent and also crossover approaches so it was very useful for us so thank you so much for this and I hope that next time we'll be able to have you here in person uh, for this workshop or for another research or methodology uh, a re a a workshop that you are planning we are already planning this we were discussing uh, here with uh, with the uh, the uh, professors and researchers that are part of panel two when we said we have to we need more space to discuss about methods and this is something that we are really engaged uh, in, 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 in uh, organizing for the next uh, few years and uh, uh, with our colleagues and with our partners from other universities in, in, in Rio and abroad. 
So thank you again, and I would like to thank everyone uh, for attending the conference today, and uh, the researchers from the Center of Excellence were also here, and the ones that organized the event. Um, I'm looking to Julia, Julia Romay, in particular thanks to Julia Romay, who organized this workshop together with me and the, uh, and, and the other researchers from the Center of Excellence. And I would like to thank uh, all international and national uh, invited professors who accepted our invitation to participate today, in line and uh, online and also in person, notably Laurence Bosson de Chazoun uh, from the University of Geneva, Diego Fernandez Arroyo from Sciences Po, uh, Paris, uh, Jean-Marc Sorel from pa Paris One, uh, Serena Forlace from Ferrara. She's uh, still here. You know, <laughs> uh, she's uh, she, she she arrived yesterday. She gave classes at the Rio School on Global Governance, Democracy, and Human Rights. And uh, and I'm happy to have you here as well today. And I know that Malcolm, for you, it's very early in the morning. So thank you <laughs> again and, and once more for for being with us. I think it's 7 a.m. In, in Sydney, right? I don't know if it's later right now. But um, and thank you also, Eli. Uh, Eli is a colleague of mine. We always uh, organize activities together. He is our invited professor at the Jomonia Center of Excellence uh, on EU South America Global Governance. Uh, we have a long-standing partnership, and, uh, and this is our plans uh, to keep working on, on methods uh, regarding international courts and tribunals. And uh, a big thanks to, to Sean Fob. Um, he made us feel very humble in our our research, right? Because we, uh, uh, of course, that we don't have. Sometimes we don't have uh, a background in mathematics in order to be able to understand all the uh, uh, all the uh, criteria and and, and uh, data that he used in his uh, in his research. But we uh, are fully engaged in in using large databases on courts. Uh, so it was very useful to to understand and to learn a little bit from him. Um, and uh, well, uh, Rafael Tinahaj is not, it's not here anymore, um, but he is from, from, from the uh, School of Maths uh, at the Getulio Vargas Foundation Law School, and also Enrique Yen is from the School of Maths. Uh, so this is, this is the way that we are conducting right now our, our current research in the Center of Excellence. I'm very happy to have you all here together because Jose Luis is also with us uh, doing research on our research projects uh, concerning courts and concerning the WHO. Um, and our student, uh, Pedro Jateni, presenting the paper uh, with Rodrigo Bellocci, uh, not here anymore. And thank you all the, the paper, the, the, the students, the PhD researchers that presented the papers here. Uh, it's really great to have you here and to have the opportunity to discuss your research. And I hope that it helped you in, your, in the process of, of constructing your database and your methodologies. Um, so thank you once again, everyone, and I hope that we can uh, we can join together and gather for other uh, events uh, from the Jamoni Center of Excellence. Thank you very much, everyone.